concerns with this project. And I just want to just uh, make sure we come back to that. But So we knew the IG had major reservations. We also know that um, these reservations raised some questions uh, in the minds of, of um, Mr. Uh, Maurice uh, Barksdale, so that in November of 13, he uh, sent a letter out, uh, which you've already categorized and we've talked about a lot. So we have these two very serious documents on the table. And then what we have is we have, and that's September 10th, 84, the closing of this building, the IG, October 29th of 84, uh, and then and then the suspension letter and the pre-clearance -pre letter of Barksdale, uh, November 13th of 84. So that's all on the record and it's pretty clear, pretty damaging for DRG. There's a meeting set up and I, I fully understand that you would meet and get to meet with people like Shirley Weissman um, and others, the career staff, uh, at this meeting in February. Uh, I do want to say, because it is a matter of record, that when we asked Secretary, uh, excuse me, Shirley Weissman and, and uh, also Janet uh, Hale, they, they both acknowledged that everyone knew that you were a former secretary, you were just too well known. But they didn't ever imply that they had a relationship with you, they knew it went way back, they just knew you were a very respected individual. And I just put that out on the table. But, but Shirley Weissman's comments to us in the hearing I think we had on Friday was that she did not find your arguments convincing at all. And her, her statement to us was that at that meeting you really um, failed to, to convince this group of people, the, the career people and herself. And then we know that you had a meeting in April 85. She was not there. She didn't really even know who the participants were. She said she felt she should have been at that meeting, and you have no reason of knowing why she wasn't there. But the, but the sad fact is that she wasn't there because maybe she would have been able to, to prevent you from being as persuasive with the participant there. Now, in your statement, being, meaning the secretary, in your statement, um, you, you make reference to the fact that you, um, we were not able to obtain what I consider to be appropriate action at the lower level within HUD. I occasionally appeal to appropriate higher authority. In this instance, um, clearly the only higher authority, uh, according to Ms. Wiseman, was, was the secretary. So in this instance, you just appeal directly to the secretary. Now, what I need to know at both these meetings, and these are the focus of my question, questions, and I'll preface it by saying this, it is just really hard for me to believe that in a meaningful conversation at the first meeting and a meaningful conversation in the second one, that the um, IG's report would not have been discussed, that the concerns of the IG would not have been discussed. So one of my questions will be, uh, was there a discussion of the IG's report or concerns that the IG had there? Did, what, did did they present some of the IG's arguments and then did you knock them down or was it not even discussed? And the second question is, were the concerns of Mr. Barksdale at the first meeting and the second meeting uh, discussed? Because they were pretty devastating. Um, so I guess my, my question is fairly clear. At both meetings, let's take the first. Was the IG uh, report or concern about DRG and particularly Colonial Realty uh, discussed at this meeting? I had not seen the IG report, and it was not mentioned at that meeting to my recollection. Whether they extrapolated a concern from the IG report, since I hadn't seen it, okay. I couldn't say. But let me tell you that uh, uh, I think Mrs. Weissman is uh, uh, a thorough professional. But my recollection of the meeting was it was open and searching. Indeed, the letter that she sent back from the meeting uh, looked like she wanted to continue the dialogue back and forth. Uh, that we, uh, I don't know if you've seen that letter, but it's a, it, uh, the, 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 it raises the, the it, it urges that we continue to work together at these problems. Now you say, did we talk at the Wiseman meeting in February, you say February 26, about the grievances of Barksdale's letter of November? 
of course, those would be a concern, but some of them had been corrected. Uh, what you have is uh, a company coming through that uh, had moved some loans through the system, corrected some of the problems, and problems are being recited. And I don't, I, I'm not putting up a brief for, for the company. They clearly have done something that's very wrong, but I just want to set the record in a way that we can all understand what we were talking about at that time. Uh, Mrs. Weissman, for example, didn't say, and I'm sure she would tell you this, uh, I want DRG out of the program. Our agenda at that meeting was to try to find a way to have DRG participate appropriately in the program. And uh, that was the discussion to the extent that we were looking for guidelines indeed for the whole, uh, that could be program wide. Well, you weren't at that hearing on Friday, but it, 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 the, she made the point very clearly that she thought the appropriate action was to continue uh, with the pre-clearance <coughs> requirement. I mean, there still could, you could still function that way, it just would have been very difficult. Let me uh, ask you in, with regard to, uh, first, was Deborah Gordine at this uh, second meeting the assistant to the secretary in the April meeting? I don't recall that at all. I have talked to a number of people, and the names that uh, I, I recall don't include hers. Um, at that second meeting, was the IG, any concerns of the IG brought up, and uh, was Mr. Barksdale's letter uh, discussed? So the same repeat question for this second meeting. Uh, neither document was, to my recollection, the focus. It was the substance of the problems. And between November and the April meeting, uh, the staffs had been working together. So there would be no need to refer back to a letter. There was an agenda of issues about which uh, uh, the DRG people and the HUD people uh, disagreed or uh, uh, had discourse. The end result of this meeting, I guess I just need to pin you down a little bit more, just, uh, and, and it really is to your advantage now to, to be done with it than to have to, to write us a letter later on. I, I want to be very specific on this. Um, to the best of your knowledge, you are saying to us that there was no discussion of any concern that the IG had with DRG or with Colonial Realty, Colonial House uh, at that second meeting? I simply don't recall it. Oh, okay. And, um, but you think there was substantive issues brought up regarding Mr. Barksdale's concern? No, I, what I was saying is that I don't recall any, anyone ever saying to me, you know, there's been an IG report that is fairly damaging about this company. Of course, they wouldn't show it to me. But uh, I don't recall anyone saying that. So what I recall is a list of problems that we were discussing and potential <laughs> focusing far more on the solution. Yeah. Uh, so I don't remember anybody saying, do you remember the Barksdale's mm -hmm. letter? Events had moved ahead. But I don't know. We were dealing with all of these issues. And uh, if somebody says they mentioned the Barksdale letter, I would not. Uh, uh, the sad thing is, I, I'm sorry. I would not uh, disagree because our, all of our rec I had a terribly difficult time uh, talking to different people and trying to refresh recollections as to who even attended the meetings. And I finally found someone with a list so that I now know who attended at least with some accuracy the February meeting. The, the sad thing is that it should have been. It should have been where there was that failing. Um, I understand that once you're in the process and you're arguing your client's case, you're going to make the best argument you can. Uh, the bottom line, though, was there was this letter of May 10th um, to your client. And I had to think of what it would be like to read this letter, because basically, as it is, as it is portrayed by the chairman, it's the most peculiar letter in the world, because basically uh, nine pages of it say you're not going to get anything. Uh, I was just asking uh, John Atwood, who I work with, and I said, imagine getting this letter. Where would you find the answer? You'd be running through nine pages to know what they're going to do. And by the, by the ninth page, you're convinced you're not going to get it, and you get it. Which makes me wonder, and I have to ask you this question, uh, and I mean no offense by it. 
Uh, did you in any way write this letter? Uh, did you uh, give anybody a copy of parts of this letter to write? Absolutely not. Um, the bottom line is I, I feel it's written by two different people. And um, I would love to uh, find out. Uh, and I don't think that uh, I, I, as a congressman, I, I write some of my letters. But the bottom line is I work with other people, and we review them, and we go over them. But others help me write them. And um, I, need to, I think we need to determine, Mr. Chairman, who, what professionals, professional or professionals, really wrote this letter. And if the secretary didn't get the letter that said no and just changed the last three paragraphs and say yes. Um, so I, I've, I basically um, concluded my points. I, I guess I just wish you had failed. Um, and I have a feeling you wish you did too. You're right. Thank you very much, Congressman Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, uh, Madam Ambassador, let me thank you for your, I mean, it's obviously not easy to sit up there and you've done a pretty good job of it in an awful situation. My first question is related to the co-insurance program relying on your expertise on housing, which yeah. at least I am going to rely on here. Um, Be careful. No, no one questions your expertise in housing. Some question where it was used and how other people interpret it, but no one questions that. I don't understand this program in this sense. If a company is insuring 19% of a mortgage, and getting a uh, origination fee of between 4.7 and 4.8 percent, and then the government is insuring it at 81 percent, it seems to me the origination fee is, is amazingly high. It means that the company can land for every four mortgages, if they're all the same size. One can fail, and the other three can make it, and the company will end up being profitable, and yet the government will end up taking huge losses. So it seems to me just terribly designed in concept because the origination fee is such a huge percentage of the risk and they get the origination fee up front. Am I wrong in that? I think you've got the wrong witness to uh, talk about the construct. I cannot uh, uh, tell you whether it's uh, fashioned correctly. A lot of people think that it was, but you need a mortgage expert to talk to you about the actuarial no, rates. Just the fact. And it's not the main line of my questioning, but just the fact that a 4.7 or 4.8 percent origination fee for a 19 percent of the total outstanding mortgage means if you're simply guaranteeing $100,000, then you get $25,000 up front. I've never heard of anything like that. Of course, the government is then backing another quick arithmetic $400,000, but it's wildly out of line. It seems as almost the person who designed it or people who designed it either wanted to line the pockets of some companies. It seems awfully hard to fail at, in fact. I would, uh, before I made that judgment, would okay. want to talk to an expert in the field. Uh, uh, the the uh, okay. government was anxious to get out of the back room uh, appraisal and underwriting of loans, and I can't tell you uh, what okay. the costs are of doing of that whole business. I'm not a mortgage banker, but there's some very good ones in the city. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question uh, relates to whose idea was it after Ms. Wiseman and Mr. Barksdale had done their thing, whose idea was it to call Secretary Pierce? Was it yours? Did you offer to the client that you would if, if I'm allowed to ask that question. Let me ask it just without the, who, whose idea was it to, uh, to, to call Secretary Pierce? I'm sure uh, I followed my usual procedure and at each stage in a uh, representation I would give the client options. You may do nothing and continue on, you may appeal, and th that's the uh, uh, A course. It is not a standard procedure to go to the secretary when you don't get your way at the, uh, at, the, at the other levels where people were turned down, is it? I would say that depending on the issue, I would never take a matter unless I thought that uh, uh, I had the right to continue up the line until the ultimate authority had been reached. Now, and that doesn't mean you always do it. it. I've had matters where I didn't. Did you know Secretary Pierce personally before you placed it? was a call that set up the meeting. You said it was about, it was a letter. So before you wrote the letter, had you met him? Did you know him? 
Well, I uh, certainly was not on a first name basis with him, but uh, you know, I was vice chairman of the President's Housing Commission. I had uh, been on several podiums introducing him. He was not a social friend. He's, uh, I don't know had him. Had you ever had a private conversation with him other than to introduce him before a group and say good speech or something like that? I don't know what you mean by a private yeah, conversation. Strike good speech. Had you ever had a uh, conversation of more than pleasantries uh, no, I, with we, him we, we, until we, that point? No, I would say that our uh, relationship was professional and I did introduce him on occasion. I have been in meetings with him on several occasions. I think many people think of me as being in the housing community, whatever that is, and there are functions. I have uh, spoken myself uh, at a number of occasions where I've met all the people that are in any administration's government. So when you say, do you sure. know them? Well, yes, no, I, understand. I do. I, just, I, I think you've given us an answer to that question. When you met with Secretary Pierce, did you make any different arguments than you made with Ms. Wiseman? I don't think so, ex well, uh, except this. Uh, Mrs. Wiseman's meeting was in February. Uh, Secretary Pierce's meeting was almost to May. Nothing had happened. We didn't have the guidelines. We didn't have the loans coming through the channel efficiently. And so the circumstance was somewhat different. But it was the same basic argument. But yes, but I would say that uh, the situation had, aggravate, had been aggravated from the client's point of view. So the concern was greater than it was in February when they were just three months into this, uh, this program. Let me ask you this question. In retrospect, your, mo your motives were noble and you were being a good lawyer for your client. Isn't it clear that Secretary Pierce thought he was doing you a favor? I and I ask that because if you look at the letter, the nine-page letter, there was obviously, here is somebody who had lifted a major decision that his underlings felt was important, and then there was no follow-up. DRG did prove to violate a lot of the things in the letter. Now, if Secretary Pierce was as serious as you say, and I'm not impugning your motives, but if Secretary Pierce was as serious as you say about straightening out the company and putting rigorous complaints upon them, don't you think he or one of his underlings on his instruction would have caught them doing the same thing they were doing before? Based to upon what has occurred, I would have thought that an auditing process would have picked up uh, the concerns that, you're now, that are now the basis of your hearing. Yeah. Uh, but. So I, doesn't that then lead to the conclusion that Sam Pierce I don't think he Pierce thought was he was doing me a favor. I mean, I don't believe it then, and I can't believe it now. I think, uh, I just wonder if he had read the IG report and, ha and uh, had gotten involved. But here, let, let's just take that again. Here is somebody who says, writes a very tough, sharp letter, as you put it, takes the company off the hook, and then doesn't follow up at all. There was no conviction motivating him, obviously. Don't you think he was impressed by the augustness of the office of secretary, of secretary or former secretary? And he said, let's give DRG's, DRG a break because they're represented by someone of such impeccable reputation as former Secretary Hills. There's no other reading there can be, or let's put it this way, there can be no reading that he meant what he said in the letter. Well, I would just say that uh, I've argued cases before him before this occasion, and I've lost. I had argued cases after this occasion, and I've lost. So that there's no history of doing me a favor. I've always thought I've done my best as a lawyer, and sometimes I win and sometimes I lose. But I would say that uh, uh, the Maybe the focus ought to be whether he followed up on the management yeah. program that he actually put in place. Was he doing me a favor, or was that his motive, or was it a failure Madam to Ambassador, manage the program? Madam Ambassador, I would simply state to the outside observer that that question is answered. Because if he was putting something in place, he would have at least be looked at it a little bit after he put it in place, and he didn't. 
And I think this is one of the more severe indictments of Samuel Pierce. And I don't mean it legally, but I mean it as a, uh, as a secretary. And I agree with, with others. It's a damn shame that you had to be the one to be uh, in the middle of this. I have another specific question here. I don't understand how at HUD there was a period where you were negotiating broad guidelines with Ms. Wiseman where DRG was negotiating guidelines, general industry guidelines, and mm -hmm. I can understand the motivation for that. Were other firms involved? Uh, or was I don't, it just I don't DRG? know that. It was her suggestion at the February meeting that, uh, you see, I walked away from that February meeting not feeling that the door had been slammed, that DRG was to stay permanently on a pre-commitment uh, approval. I walked away thinking that HUD was going to continue to look at DRG as they submitted their loans one by one and that they would look at broad guidelines. Indeed, when you look at her letter, it suggests that they will look for broad guidelines. I said to our client in the meeting in the hearing of all, I think that you ought to go work with the HUD people to try to develop those guidelines. Whether other people and the industry worked, I don't know. Okay, I just find it rather strange. I'd find it even more strange if they were the only company involved. But here, you're asking uh, another company that has had a poor track record to help develop guidelines about how to police the, the, themselves. Well, I'm not talking about the policy people. I'm talking about the, the uh, people who have the technical data. You know, it, it's what I call the office capacity. Uh, it's useful to have those people when you're trying to develop a system who can talk about it, particularly if they happen to have a large slice of the market, which DRG did. I wanted DRG to cooperate. I obviously wanted them to correct their problems. And that would have been the best solution to this, this uh, issue, as it often is the case in regulatory matters. If you can get the client to correct the difficulty, then you don't have a dispute any longer. Sure. Okay. Another question. What legal, what kind of legal work I don't mean overall work, but what kind of legal work did you do? Did you submit any legal briefs? Did you make, uh, did you do some case research? What was your involvement in this DRG situation other than writing some letters to Secretary Pierce and going to a meeting and arguing the case that you laid out before? Did we you do any legal research? Oh, yes. I don't uh, mean the firm, I mean you personally. Right, well, we work in a cooperative manner, and uh, if somebody does the rough research and we work together, but uh, we had to be very familiar with the co-insurance uh, co regulations. It's a, an intricate program. We also had to be familiar with the regulations that both the Barksdale right. letter and Mrs. Weissman cited. Madam that Secretary, we, you had mentioned a few times here that you're not familiar with the coinsurance program. Well, I haven't thought about it for a long time. Oh, but you were familiar with it back then? Well, yes, and when I present a case, I will be familiar with those regulations. That doesn't, the regulations that are pertinent to the case, that doesn't mean that I am an expert in, uh, in structuring a, uh, uh, an underwriting program, but I can certainly read the regulation and understand how it works and do that when I was in practice quite regularly across a broad range of regulatory measures. Because it does seem that most of your activity was something that you could do whether you were a lawyer or not. It was much more in the realm of being, of knowing housing. Oh, I don't think so. No? Okay. I don't think so. I, I, I'm sure that other people could have done what I did without a law degree, perhaps by hiring a lawyer to provide the analytical work, but I do think that this was a case that was appropriately handled. And indeed, if not, we that, did handle it as lawyers. But I mean, it seems to me, again, I, and nothing you have said has dissuaded me, that it was not your, your skill as lawyer that was being used here. It was either your skill as housing expert or your skill as knowing some people. Now well, try to dissuade me from I that. Don't I don't see much legal. I don't see much legal uh, legal activity here in the letters and the arguments that you've said, et cetera. I understand. I have to read regulations as a congressman to understand a program. That's not being a lawyer. Well, I don't know what your definition of a lawyer is. Is a, if you say a lawyer is only one who stands up in court, 
than regulatory practice where you meet with an agency and talk both in terms of the regulations that are on the books and in terms of the implication on policy of those regulations. I consider that lawyering, but uh, I suppose someone else uh, uh, could, could do some of that. Let me ask you a uh, final question. Well, I have one other question. Do you have any other dealings with Deborah Gordon other than uh, the one you mentioned, other than, well, any, I guess? I haven't mentioned any, but I have one case where she was involved. The d involving DRG? No. Okay, I guess that will have to wait for the uh, second round under the chairman's thing. I have one more question. One more question and observation. Ms. Hills, I, I agree with, I mean, one person who I respect came over and described you as the finest HUD secretary that we have had. And I know nothing to dispute that. Uh, I think you're an honorable and decent person. But I would say to you, in all honesty, to the outside observer, it would seem that your purpose, you knew the law better, you didn't try to make millions of dollars, but to the outside observer, it would seem that your main purpose was getting through and getting through quickly to Samuel Pierce. And even though that is part of how the system works and lawyers with excellent reputations and other positions obviously have access that just as skilled lawyers who don't have those reputations uh, don't have, the system reeks. And my question to you is, do you think the system ought to be changed? Do you think given your experience here, given the fact that because you were a former HUD secretary, you could get through to Secretary Pierce far more quickly than other equally honest and qualified and capable and knowledgeable lawyers, that something ought to be changed? Or is it just that we had a weak HUD secretary? I mean, the blame really falls on him, at least in this gentleman's opinion. Uh, is it simply a question of picking decent people to be there? Clearly, you want to have the strongest people in charge of the departments as you possibly can. And uh, I think to have management skills is very, very helpful. I don't know what you'd have an old HUD secretary who's a lawyer do uh, and stay in Washington. Uh, if you are precluded from p making your presentation because you think the world is going to cave, that has not been my experience. I do my best to present the facts as I know them. Uh, I present them in regulatory agencies, even in legislative uh, fora, uh, and in court from time to time. I consider myself a lawyer. Uh, we logged a lot of hours as what I call lawyering. If I don't think the system would be protected by precluding people like myself from making a presentation to the secretary. As I said to you earlier, I heard presentations like this all the time, and I call them as I saw them, just as I'm doing now. I have industry coming in one by one, talking to me. Sometimes I agree with my staff, sometimes I don't. I try to do my homework. I think it is important to pick people who work very hard to learn the facts and the premises of the case, to ask questions of the staff when the staff disagrees so that you can understand where the staff is coming from and why it is you don't agree. Madam Secretary, was there the kind of influence peddling in your administration at HUD that there was in Secretary Pierce's? I can only say there was no influence peddling in the Ford administration or when I served at, at uh, HUD. I really don't want to cast dispersions in a situation where I don't know what all the facts are. It looks awful, but I'm a lawyer. And as I said earlier, sometimes you hear the prosecutor's plea, and then when you listen to the defense, your view changes. And I haven't sat in on all your hearings. I applaud your hearings. I think you must get to the bottom of it. It grieves me greatly. I felt that one of my challenges when I was secretary, and I did put in a management by objective system, was to ensure that the people at HUD could stand tall and be proud of working at HUD, and that put as a first priority in programs that were subject to dangerous abuse because of the money involved, 
that the secretary took an interest. So contrary to some of the suggestion that the secretary ought not to meet and know the tough issues, I couldn't disagree more. No, I think the secretary should meet, it's that be engaged, talk to the inspector general. I must have met with the inspector general twice a week. I fired two assistant secretaries for malfeasance. So I think it takes a yes, see, it's good, strong secretary to run that place because that's the job. It's and to say you're not going to ever overrule your subordinates no, no is crazy. The question here, and just to reiterate, is not overruling subordinates. We want hands-on managers. It simply seems to this, I think to most of us on the committee, that Secretary Pierce was never hands-on unless someone who he knew asked him to be. And so I guess what I'd say in conclusion is I think it's a, uh, it's a terrible system. And it's just unfortunate that a good person like you had to be involved in it in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Ambassador, thank you for um, the, the straightforward way in which you've been addressing a, a, a long series of questions. I will try to be to the point. Uh, the first is uh, first question I have is this uh, case, this DRG case, was that the first occasion you had to present a regulatory matter to Secretary Pierce? For any client? Of any kind. No, I believe that I had presented other regulatory matters uh, uh, to the Secretary. I have tried to uh, get a list of of matters that uh, I have worked on uh, and uh, uh, would you like me to describe one or two? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know how many instances prior to this particular case you, you had occasion to present matters to the secretary. I don't have a perfect count. I uh, know that um, I know of at least one occasion where I had made a presentation on a regulatory matter to the secretary, first to the assistant secretary, uh, first to the director of the office with his staff, then to the assistant secretary, first to George Hips and his staff, then to Mr. Abrams and his staff with Hips and, and then with the secretary in 1982. And that was on a a, do you want to know about the case? I don't want to get into details because I do want to stick to DRG, but I would just like to know what, what area of the, what program it involved. It was when HUD imposed a seven and three quarter cap uh, on Section 8 cost amendments. I think you've described that in your testimony, in your, in your written testimony, and I think I understand that in that instance you had occasion to, to um, appear before the Secretary, meet with uh, Secretary Pierce. It was very similar to this. I met with the uh, office director and his group, which was a large meeting. I brought it up to the assistant secretary, uh, which was even a larger meeting. And then I presented it to Secretary Pierce. And uh, he, they all, each level, ruled against me. I finished, and I felt I was right. And uh, fr frankly, uh, the Congress took care of it, because that was handled in the uh, uh, the House and Senate uh, appropriations bill, but uh, I left feeling it's wrong what you've done, and uh, and uh, so I don't always agree with uh, the ruling I get. Uh, did um, were there were there other occasions then that you also met with Secretary Pierce in order to try to resolve a matter for a client? Yes. Uh, you asked for before 1984, and that's why I went backwards. There were others after 1984 that I've been able to find, and uh, uh, one of them was on the, uh, that loan that I mentioned to the chairman that was on the Title X loan that had been assigned. There was a meeting with uh, uh, Secretary Pierce, uh, really with the general counsel because this was a, an issue that could have applied to other insurance policies. But he saw it differently and they did not agree with me in that occasion either. 
That was in 1986. Uh, perhaps I can, can speed this process by asking this. Did you, did you find it um, the usual practice when you had a regulatory matter that you did not receive satisfaction from the um, relevant assistant secretary or, or, or whoever was in, in charge below the secretary, that you were able to get a meeting expeditiously with Secretary Pierce to deal with the question, to make a final ruling? Sometimes it, it took longer. I don't know that I always, on every matter that I had, I didn't have that many matters, elevated them. If I thought it was a matter of policy, uh, I would try if the client was willing. I had a matter involving the interstate uh, uh, um, land sales act and uh, I thought that was a policy issue, and I can recall, that was 1987, so I recall it fairly clearly. I said to the client, you have a choice. You can do what the, uh, the interstate land sales want you to do. You could appeal it higher to the assistant secretary, and then, of course, to higher authority. Or you could make a counterproposal to the staff and see whether you could change their view. And, uh, that the, it was the latter that we did, and that turned out to be nobody's first choice, but everybody's uh, choice. And uh, we resolved the case that way. The, um, the reason I'm pursuing this, this line of questions is that um, you, you have um, spoken of your own tenure as secretary, and consistent with your reputation as a person who was involved um, and, and conscientious about her work. Uh, you've talked about the access that you believe appellants in the administrative process should have to the secretary to make their case if they have a policy level uh, issue. Um, and would it be fair to say that your, exper your personal experience with Secretary Pierce was that you, for your clients, had that kind of access? The same sort that I would afford another yes. litigant or petitioner? Yes. I would say that I did. And I would say this, that um, uh, when I was secretary, if someone tried to see me once and uh, abused the time, I would be less willing to see them the second time. Do you understand what yes, I'm I saying? Yes, I certainly do. Uh, that, uh, uh, but I did want particularly policy issues to be brought to me, and I did spend the day seeing a lot. We had lots of different meetings on tough regulatory issues. Now, did you ever discuss with colleagues, others who, had, who were in the, the business of representing clients in the housing area before HUD, did you ever discuss with them their experiences in terms of access to the secretary? No. Did you, did you have any knowledge during this time period of how easy or hard it generally was uh, to have access to Secretary Pierce over a, a policy matter in the department? But you must understand, I, uh, in my last uh, three years of practice, well, 1988, seven, and part of six, I only had three matters that have even any rub with, uh, with HUD. No, I mean, I, I was such an infrequent applicant, uh, I, uh, and I'm absolutely sure that the last three years are accurate. I mean, there is no possibility no. that I'm overlooking anything because I have a clear and present recollection, helped by uh, some of the filings I had to do for the government, that I know the matters are absolutely complete. And uh, uh, of the uh, uh, three matters, uh, None of them went to Secretary Pierce. My, my point really is not what you've been very clear about the access that you had. And this is really following on Mr. Schumer's point about the comparison of the access you had to others. I can tell you as a member of the subcommittee on housing of the banking committee that we didn't see Secretary Pierce from 1984 onward and that he actively refused to be available to that subcommittee under a number of circumstances. So um, we have some experience here, and I know others who had cases before HUD had similar experiences, that the meetings that actually occurred for them uh, often were the, the secretary was not available. 
And you can understand that giving rise to the question of, are you peddling influence right. or is this secretary responding only to people that he believes are influential? And it would not, it would not be wrong of you to seek to go before the secretary on behalf of your client. That seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And uh, on the other hand, what we seem to be learning about the secretary's behavior is that those who, in fact, got an answer, yes, I will see you, depended on something other than the merit of the case or the procedure. And so that doesn't make it influence peddling on your behalf, to, but it does raise questions about the way in which the secretary conducted his business that seemed perhaps we should call it favoritism in his extending of access uh, to people. And that favoritism seemed to be turning on something other than the merits of the issue, the presentation of his staff, staff or otherwise. And that does seem to me to be what is consistent with your testimony and other testimony we, we've received. Now, you also um, had these meetings with the secretary. I'd like to, to know if you can characterize his participation in these meetings. In other words, did Secretary Pierce, when you met with him, play an active, inquisitive role on the case, or was he impassive? Did he just sit there and did all the discussion take place uh, among staff or assistant secretaries and, and representatives of your client? Which way was it? Well, Mr. Morrison, uh, with my best recollection, I can only absolutely document uh, four meetings that I had with the secretary, and since we have this co-insurance as one of them, I can say that the room was crowded, that he listened to the discussion, and I recall him asking some questions, but uh, that's what I recall, a few questions. A few questions. Now, you had said that um, uh, one of the standards that you set for yourself, and it, it is indeed a high, uh, a high ethical standard, uh, that you would not take a matter before HUD, I think you were referring to HUD, which was seeking relief that you would yourself not have granted as Secretary of HUD, given whatever your state of knowledge was about, about okay. that case. Do I accurately represent right. what you said? Um, and, I, and I do believe that's a very high standard and, and a good one. Uh, now, my question about, uh, about the DRG case is um, knowing what you know now, but, but I want, I'm going to work back from it. But knowing what you know now, um, would this be such a matter that you believe ought to have received the, the dispensation that was given? That is the, uh, the, the permission to once again initiate underwriting approvals and to close cases prior to HUD review rather than after? No. You wouldn't do it now. Um, the, um, Based on the facts that you've given me, I would like to read the IG's report and see if there's any possibility of, uh, of coming, but, but based upon what I've heard and, and read in the paper, I don't see how you could conceivably say that uh, you would not hold a hearing and try to take some stringent action against this company. So you believe that if knowing what we know now that this is a debarment kind of case, a case where this, uh, this group should have been barred from continuing to participate in the co-insurance program. It's based upon hearsay, but there's some very uh, uh, strident comments that the chairman has read to me from, uh, I guess it was the 88 uh, IG's report. Now, the, the um, inspector general was engaged in an audit of this co-insurance program and of DRG's activities beginning in 1984 and, and finishing the field work in March of 1985, right, really right in the same period yes. in which you were advocating the actions that uh, you were successful in getting, that is allowing, allowing um, DRG to continue. Um, you also spoke about your own tenure as Secretary of HUD and said that you met with the uh, IG twice a week? Very frequently. Very frequently. Um, it, if you were in a position as Secretary of HUD and there were that kind of an investigation going on, would you, in the course of that kind of a six months of, 
of field work and investigation, would you have regularly received reports about what was being looked into? Oh, yes. I would not only have regularly received reports, I would have had weekly meetings or more frequently with the Inspector General. And he would know that I would want to be kept up to date knowing as the problem evolved and I wouldn't take action uh, I, un, until I had the facts. In other words, I wouldn't have changed the status with respect to a particular company that was under such heavy scrutiny. So if you were Secretary of HUD, uh, rather than attorney for the, for the claimant, and there was an IG investigation going on looking right into the very questions that were the result of the adverse administrative action that had been taken, um, you would have looked deeply into that IG investigation and not made a conclusion until you were satisfied that the problem had been resolved. Well, and I would certainly have talked to the Inspector General and said, uh, are these matters serious? Are they matters of uh, willful uh, in, uh, uh, intent? Are they so sloppy? Are they so negligent as to cause us a problem? And what you're telling me is that you're reading the report to me and say, yes, that's what we're reading in this report. That being the case, yes, your conclusion is correct. Well, in November, you, there was a report that was read to you from, November, from 1988, but there was also a report in November of 1985. I have not seen yeah. that. And I, I don't, I'm not But even that report to, would have been after the Secretary's letter in May. That's correct, but that report was being prepared. The contrast I'm drafting here, I, mean, I, think, the, I think the government, the people of the United States would have been very well served if you had been acting as Secretary of HUD during this critical period, because what you have described is the kind of oversight and response to problems that I believe this subcommittee and its investigation is wishing had been going on uh, during the last administration. Because in fact, there were at hand in these documents just the kinds of facts that you've referred to that would have ought to have given the Secretary pause about granting the relief that, uh, that you requested. And you acting as attorney for your client uh, or not expected to have all the information that the Secretary might have. But did I understand you to say earlier that, that in this meeting with uh, Secretary Pierce, there was no mention whatsoever of an IG's investigation on the DRG situation? I surely don't think so. I do not recollect it. And if you had been Secretary and there were similar facts, would you have brought that kind of issue up in, in challenging assertions by the claimant that, uh, that everything was okay and they should get a better treatment they were getting? I'm not sure I would tell the claimant that uh, uh, an, an Inspector General's uh, uh, investigation was ongoing. I, I'm not sure I would share that fact. I, I would talk to the Inspector General as to whether I could make reference to it, but I would certainly be skeptical of the statements that the uh, problems were de minimis when I knew that my Inspector General had just told me that morning that the problems were substantial. And the, po and the, and the important point there is that you would keep yourself, in doing the, your duty as Secretary, you would keep yourself up to date on the various investigations the IG was conducting and would expect that to be your responsibility uh, to know the range of things that the Secretary was looking at, that the IG was looking into. Yeah, and I would be disappointed if the IG knew I was meeting with a major company, uh, one of the, I mean, it's like an oligopoly. I guess there were 28 companies, somebody said, at the recess in coinsurance. I don't know whether that's a fact, but there were two companies that had the major portion. And, uh, I mean, the communications was such that the Inspector General would have known that I was meeting with, as the Chairman has said, bad actor and his attorney, and would have told me, uh, warned me, kept me apprised of where it was and, and what our walk-around room was. I mean, uh, I met very regularly with the Inspector General. When I formed the, ma the Mortgage Review Board, we had, I thought, a very good program that protected due process of the mortgagees that we were reviewing, yet protecting the government, because we had a strata, a hearing, which included the Inspector General, with a right to appeal and an ultimate uh, right under the administrative, uh, you know, the other, the ultimate uh, right of a hearing. So we protected all interests, but we structured it knowing that we were going to run into problems. Well, Madam Ambassador, I think that your testimony 
speaks well for you, for you, but I think it's damning testimony with respect to Secretary Pierce, because I think that all the things that you say that you would have done and that by your own record you did do when you were Secretary are the very things that he failed to do to protect the taxpayer and to protect the programs and to protect the people who were supposed to benefit from the program so that um, it's, a, it's a sad event that, uh, that we are discovering these things so far after the fact that little can be done to repair the damage. But I thank you for your direct answers. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, we would like to deal with uh, the remaining issue uh, expeditiously because two other witnesses are waiting to testify. So let me just stipulate the facts as you indicated them in your testimony with respect to the, uh, the moderate rehabilitation project in which you became involved. I only have probably two questions. The first one is this. Recognizing that the local housing authorities were interested in this project, you were nevertheless retained not by the local housing authorities, but you were retained by a developer. Is that correct? That is correct. The developer was paying our fee. Is it not true, Madam Secretary, that the proper way this program was designed to work was for the public housing authority to apply for mod rehab units, obtain such mod rehab units, then advertise as widely as possible, so on a competitive basis, a broad spectrum of developers may apply to do the job. That is correct. And I should tell you that the, uh, the executive director of Broward County Housing Authority, before I made any representation or even agreed to handle the developer, called, I spoke to him telephonically, I believe, but I have a letter uh, stating he would like some help and that Mrs. Sweezy had been helpful in trying to bring low-income housing to his area. It's a good letter and I called him and spoke with him. Uh, there were not a lot of developers in the low-income housing area in his county and uh, he uh, made no deal with Mrs. Sweezy. I think she suspected that because there were few that she stood a good chance on advertisement to prevail, but there was no assurance of that. Well, we have heard during the course of these hearings some egregious cases. I know you have. Where the local housing authority did not know that anything was happening until after the units had been awarded. I'm not suggesting that this is at all a parallel case. But the fact remains, does it not, that it does find the propriety of the process when units are obtained as it were specifically for a developer rather than for a housing authority. I think they should go directly to the housing authority. In fact, I would, have had, I would have advocated had I stayed at HUD to have a housing block grant so that you could tailor your housing programs more to the needs of the localities. I came to the conclusion from my time at HUD that Little Rock isn't like New York and San Jose is nothing like uh, New Jersey and so that the closer you get to the people, the better your structure is. And so it is fine to have the choice of new, existing, and rehabilitated housing, but to mandate that from Washington, you often miss your mark. That if you have a set aside and you say, this is our only program and it's all going to be new, you're going to overbuild in great parts of the country today that already have too much housing. And yet if you say to, areas, well, we'll only use existing, that's fine where the vacancy rates are high, but where markets are very tight, it doesn't seem to work. So that's just one person's view of uh, a better distribution mechanism. Madam Secretary, the developer offered to pay you at what uh, 
Secretary Jim Watt calls the going rate at a rate of $1,000 per unit. That's correct. You rejected that. Yes. And you suggested that you be paid on the basis of a hourly legal fee. No, well, correctly, I stated that uh, we would bill on the basis of our normal billing practices for the firm, which contemplated a, uh, a, a, an hourly, some component of time, plus a success fee if we were successful. And uh, that was satisfactory with the client. Did it bother you that the developer initially offered to pay $1,000 a unit? I thought it was very strange. Was I had never heard of that before. Was it only strange or was it sort of the placing of a fee on a publicly available resource that should not be peddled? Well, uh, I can see how you could say that. Uh, well, do you agree with before, the way of saying it? Well, before I took on, I, I only did one of these programs, yes. and I was uh, interested in it because of the description of the difficulty of getting through the regulations. Uh, this woman, who was a vice president of the uh, Hialeah uh, uh, City Council, came in. I'd never seen her before, and uh, she was obviously quite interested in bringing low-income housing to Florida, South Florida. Uh, I asked her to send me references. I was, I was puzzled. I said, why is it? What's the trouble? She said, well, Broward County has gotten no, no, uh, uh, no units for three years. It has this enormous need. It's a county over a million people, enormous influx of Hispanics, and, uh, and I am a developer. She did subsequently send me material about herself. She was a successful developer of 200 units. She was a reputable person. She had been very active in civic affairs, uh, giving of her time. And then I got a letter from the Broward Housing County, uh, the, the Broward, House, uh, Broward County Housing Authority, from the executive director saying, "This woman has really helped us. I wish you would help us too." And uh, so I became interested in the case. I'm sort of sorry I did. I, I can understand that. I can understand that. However, I should tell you that the project is a, a really a wonderful project, and it was handled in every particular in every particular way lawfully. Uh, the units were advertised. There were three applicants. Uh, one was outside the jurisdiction of the housing authority, and the other had only the capacity to do much fewer than many fewer than the units secured. And as uh, the client predicted, because she is in the business, and I, this is true in many counties, there is one developer who is more capable of doing redevelopment work or rehabilitation work than others. She was uh, the developer, and the units have been written up in the paper down there. They're uh, quite good. And there was a great need. Since, uh, since this uh, proposed payment per unit disturbed you, I take it. Did it? Yes, I said I, we would not bill on that basis. Okay. Did you discuss this at all with Secretary Pierce? No. In retrospect, should you have? Well, I didn't think uh, more about it when I knew I would be billing at our rate, but perhaps I should have. Uh, I just didn't think. I'll be happy to you. Uh, I think magnify the question, were you aware after you were offered this that this would become common practice? No, not at all. Okay. So, as far I thought it was her your mental need. state where she was saying to me, I've got, the, this is how I will pay you. I said, well, we're not, we don't bill that way at our firm. Did you ever find out later on that it was common knowledge that you could make a thousand dollars on the street? Uh, Okay. Absolutely not. Not until I picked up the paper and read about uh, how the program I, was being administered. May I ask one more question, Mr. Chairman? Please. Yeah. If, if you had learned um, that unlike when you were secretary, it was common knowledge that people were making money, a thousand dollars a unit, uh, getting them earmarked for a particular area, is it possible you would have spoken to uh, the secretary or someone else? And, yes. Yeah. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to briefly thank uh, 
uh, the Madam Secretary and Ambassador for appearing today. And you live up to your advanced building and be forthright and uh, courageous at moments and certainly very candid. We're, we appreciate that. One passing observation in, in the form of a, a brief question. How does one control an executive assistant just by selecting the right person and making sure that executive assistant runs everything past you as secretary? And did your executive assistant ever have the authority to use your name uh, without clearing with you, without coming back to you for telling you what he or she had done? Well, you set guidelines for your executive assistant like you do with all of the people with whom you worked. I had two spectacular uh, executive assistants when I was at HUD, and uh, I cannot imagine them sending something forth from the department without my being apprised. So here In she my had... current status, uh, uh, things do not go out of my office unless I am apprised. And I expect my executive assistant to help me do that, to help me manage the place. So at, under no circumstances could he approve a project without your absolute authority to do so? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really have only two uh, brief questions to fill gaps and then one uh, question of my own. Uh, I think that in your prepared statement, Madam Secretary, you state that in point of fact the uh, units for Dade County were not awarded to the developer whom you represented, which is an indication that at least in that in the instance that you had, the advertising was followed through and somebody else qualified for the program, for those units rather than, than uh, the Swayze company. Is that that's correct? I, I think my testimony says that I don't know what happened to the units, I just know that she didn't get them. Right, right. Uh, and then the second, I think that uh, just to follow up on Mr. Morrison's questions, were there any occasions, you had mentioned I think that, that you had four meetings with uh, Secretary Pierce on right. four matters. Were there any occasions where you requested a meeting with Mr. Pierce that were refused? There may have been. I uh, just don't recall it. The ones I recall are the ones where I uh, that those uh, the ones that were did, granted. Uh, but uh, there was. Uh, I mentioned on the record uh, here that uh, I said none of my meetings, none of my matters that involved uh, when I was at Walgotchel and Mangies did it involve a meeting with the, the uh, secretary. Right. And that was accurate. There was one of the matters where, by stipulation, I believe, uh, we all agreed that it should be reviewed by the secretary or at least I was going to appeal to the secretary, and I thereby requested a meeting, and I didn't get one, but I did get the result, and I don't think that's what you were right, after. Right, right. In other words, the secretary met with his general counsel and the other parties outside of my hearing, and I subsequently heard that they had ruled the way I would have urged them to rule. Right. Uh, but I, that I, is the one instance, but then you must understand we're talking about uh, uh, eight years and uh, I have ha I can only document in my recollection uh, four meetings with the secretary uh, two where I know he ruled against me one the subject of your focus where he ruled for me and one where we can't even figure out what we talked about I just know that uh, Messrs. Hips, Lasco, Taylor and Hills were there and that was in 1981 and I said to one of the participants why were we meeting? And, uh, no, and he said it must have been a uh, either about the President's Commission, a broad policy issue, because at that time none of his appointees were in place. That was in early March of 1981. He'd just been sworn in himself. So we can't figure out what it was that, uh, but those are the professionals, those are the greats. Right. I've just named uh, uh, George Hibbs, Warren Lasco. Uh, and Fred Taylor, those right. were the but, people but who again, ran the department. Uh, with, without belaboring the point, the reason I wanted to follow up to Mr. Morris is because he was suggesting that, again, regardless of your intent in this situation, it appears that from Secretary Pierce's behavior, it is possible to conclude that there was an element of favoritism as to who in fact had access to meet with him. And so I was anxious to know 
and if you can clarify or refresh your thinking or get anything further from the record, if, if there were instances, you, you said, for example, that in, the, in 88, 87, 86, you had only three matters that, that uh, you dealt with with HUD at all. Correct. So there, it, it seems to me that, that probably you could refresh in your own mind uh, after some effort as to whether there were any instances in which you had actually requested a meeting with Secretary Pierce in which he had said, no, I'm not going to meet with her. I have no trouble from 86 on, right. but to go back to 78 when I was with Latham, I just don't know. I don't have the files. I don't know the issues. No, uh, only, only from 80, 81 on. Pardon? Only from 81 on. He, uh, he I, was only secretary I think from I have on. given you a good listing of meetings. Right. As I say, housing was a small portion of right. my overall practice. It would be surprising that uh, I would have a larger number of cases uh, between 80 and 86 than I did from 86 to, to the uh, 86, 87, and 88. Right. So, so I think it's a pretty good sum, uh, uh, right. slice. So that what you're telling me, I, I guess, is that the, your, to the best of your ability to recollect, there were no occasions on which you requested a meeting with the Secretary, Secretary Pierce, that is, and did not, not, not get that meeting. I think that's probably, uh, I, right. I, well, I don't recollect them. Right. If it occurred, I don't remember it. Right, okay. Uh, and then finally, um, only because this had come up repeatedly in the course of the uh, prior sessions, uh, prior hearings, and Mr. Frank sort of alluded to it uh, glancingly, but I think that we really ought to ask it of you directly. There has been the suggestion uh, through the course of these hearings from some of the members that uh, there, th what was, there was nothing unusual about what went on during the Pierce administration of HUD. That, in fact, the programs were just open invitations for influence peddling and favoritism, and that it went on, it went on back to the Ford and the, and the Carter administrations, and it, it, it may be different personnel, different, different programs, but the same, same kind of stuff went on. I'd like your comments in response to that. I don't believe that uh, there is any problem uh, that you can trace back to the Ford administration. There was a new program, the 1974 Housing and Community Development Act, and uh, prior to that there had been difficulties with mortgage bankers, and there had been some difficulties with demolition contractors. Keep in mind that was a period where there, we were in a severe recession. When I walked into HUD, we had the lowest number of starts until a very long time. And uh, yet I believe that we administered the new program, which was uh, converting from subsidizing bricks and mortar to putting money in the beneficiary's pocket so that they could provide, uh, they could obtain shelter, whether it be new, existing, or rehabilitated. And uh, I do not re uh, recall scandal but we ran a very, very tight ship. Uh, we had a meeting with the regional administrators and talked in terms of how many units of housing would be reserved and got a plan that was within the art of the possible. And we tracked that. Uh, we doubled audits where we thought we had problems in difficult areas. I've already mentioned to you in the mortgage area, we also had problems. We doubled the audits. We engaged the industry because in, in a self-governance effort. You don't have enough policemen in the world to take care of a problem if you don't have a system and you don't have the cooperation of the industry. And so I would respectfully dissent from those who say that uh, such problems existed then. Now, subsequently, I cannot tell with the same forthright, uh, hands-on uh, uh, knowledge because I wasn't there. There have been problems that, of course, I've read about in, uh, in the administration following the Ford administration. I think it's very important in this department to have guidelines, to have management goals, to have adequate people. Uh, that requires uh, uh, some cooperation with Congress as well. And in the area you're focusing on, I think that a good number of very good people were lost over time. 
But I thank you very much. And, and uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I simply want to state that that which has been stated by a number of, of our colleagues on this subcommittee, which is that your conduct and behavior I think is so far different and superior to that of most of the witnesses that we've had here. I think you have reason to be proud of the way that you've conducted yourself throughout the situation. And is it, it is just unfortunate that because of the way that that office, that the department was run, that even good people can get caught up in situations that they would not willingly uh, want to get involved in. I thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. I simply want to uh, agree with the last comment by our colleague from New York and uh, State Ambassador Hills that as with the co-insurance program we talked about earlier, it seems that the evidence shows that your legal work on the moderate rehab program was perfectly legal, ethical, appropriate in every way. And I appreciate, too, uh, your willingness to spend so much time with us today and also your views on, on uh, how some of these uh, HUD projects should operate properly. You've been candid and thorough and professional and very patient, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. I also concur with my colleagues. And just for the record, though, I want to make sure you respond to Charles uh, Schumer's question of your one contact with uh, Deborah Gordine. Yes. Um, it doesn't have to be a long response, but uh, just need to know where it was and so on. Well, that again, all my housing cases are so interesting. Um, that was a case where the menorah housing uh, project out in uh, California and uh, Mr. Saffron, who was a developer in California and the mayor of Beverly Hills, uh, had developed at some great difficulty uh, a low-income elderly housing project for Beverly Hills. And uh, the fact is that Beverly Hills' proportion of elderly is about two times that of L.A. County. I know people smile when you say Beverly Hills, but you know, poor people can live in uh, affluent neighborhoods. Of the fact that they have a disproportionately high group of elderly, 40% are class were then, when I was looking at the case, were classified as very low income, an additional 20% as low income. So 60% of the elderly were in bad shape and they had not any elderly housing. The menorah uh, housing people, I felt, were very good. Um, they had got, Beverly Hills had been extremely generous. They had donated $8 million of money plus uh, the land right in the middle of what Beverly Hills calls the Golden Triangle. Very, very valuable land. And they had done something that in California is not often done by a bedroom community. You know, you may be telling us more than we want to know. Um, but you uh, really have to know. Okay, as long, as, long as you, okay. <laughs> Well, it just, it's just such a good case uh, okay. uh, for the policy. This is a policy I, 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 issue. I um, what occurred was that the local housing authority out there from HUD decided that Beverly Hills, having gone through a public referendum, which you have to do to have right. low-income housing in your jurisdiction, and at some political risk, uh, Beverly Hills could not give those units to Beverly Hills citizens. It would have to advertise them countywide, even though the county broke down into 17 submarkets, each of which was different from the other. And so the developer came back, and we had a meeting. I was retained, and we had a meeting. I attended with another lawyer. We researched the law, and the, the issue was whether the facts in this case as presented uh, warranted granting a residency re uh, preference to Beverly Hills citizens. Now the law, the, the department handbook clearly permitted it without a question, but no guidelines had been written. And the local housing authority was working off of an early 1973 presidential speech. We had a, a long hearing, not unlike the one I would have had with uh, Mrs. Weissman. The assistant secretary for equal opportunity decided no. In answer to, uh, and the uh, Larry Goldberger a staff person, I don't know why the assistant secretary wasn't there, decided yes, they should have a preference. The issue being, if you don't let bedroom communities use their funds to house their own people, it's hard enough to get them to build low-income housing, they simply won't build it. The, the argument on the side of the equal opportunity people was, I'd rather have no housing than to provide a housing that didn't, that provided a precedent where you had a residency preference, which was different from the county as a large. 
I appeal the case, it was even, and I appeal to the secretary. My recollection is that the file went upstairs and it was on a very close time. Menorah had agreed to put out by lottery these units within a week or so and uh, requested a meeting with the secretary. And it's at that point, either I call Debbie Dean, or Debbie Gorgine? Yes, you got uh, And sought the meeting with the secretary or the two people in the department did. But in any event, she was involved and I subsequently got a call back saying it won't be necessary to meet with the secretary. The secretary has met with the general counsel and the parties at HUD and has decided to grant the preference. Okay. Fine. That's one thing. The word went out and Menorah was delighted and it too was a wonderful project. But within five days, I get a call from them and they say, we're having a terrible time. The lottery's gone out. We're already forming the waiting list. And the local HUD office says that the preference that we got for the, the uh, project as a whole will not apply to the waiting list. Can you get some clarification? So I called Mrs. Dean and said, can I get the secretary? I don't want to bother him about this, but it doesn't make any sense that he'd give a preference for the project, but not for the waiting list, yet the local head of, HUD office is saying this. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, I will take it up with the secretary. And subsequently, a lengthy opinion, three or four pages, came out of the general counsel's office, directed directly to the HUD office, but I got a copy of it. And that was the end of that case. And in that course, that was the only time I recall meeting in her office. And I don't know whether it was to get the meeting in the first instance or it was to come in and try to persuade her that I needed to get in to see the secretary in the second instance. But in both instances, uh, uh, that was my total exposure to her, although I did see her at housing meetings with the secretary and with others. Thank you. I hope your next weekend is a better weekend than the past weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, again, um, as I started out, I want to commend you and the um, subcommittee on the fine work you're doing, and I want to especially commend you on the manner in which you conduct your hearings. This is the first one I've sat with you. I've known you for many years, ever since you've been in the Congress, and uh, I'm one of your admirers, as you know, and I want to commend you on the manner in which you've conducted this hearing today. And I'd just like to add to Ambassador Hills in addition to all the other nice things that have been said about you, I want to commend you on something that hasn't been mentioned so far, and that's your physical endurance. <laughs> for ex with exception for a small uh, recess, you've been in that witness chair for almost five and a half hours. So congratulations also on your physical endurance. But again, thank you for your testimony, and um, you are, as I said before, a very outstanding person, and I commend you on the manner in which you conducted yourself, not only as a lawyer, but also in, in public service. Thank you, Mr. Thank Martin, you, Mr. very Chairman. much. I want to thank my friend from New Jersey for joining us, Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to focus for a moment or two on your um, two mod rehab cases that uh, you cited in your prepared testimony. Uh, that Those were the only uh, mod section eight, mod rehab section eight uh, cases you were involved in during yes. the Secretary Pierce's term. And uh, who did you represent? You represented Swayze Realty, is that right? Right. But uh, as they, I mentioned, they, I did not represent her until I had contacted the executive director. Uh, I had been contacted by the executive director of the Broward, How uh, Broward County Housing Authority. Actually, she came in first seeking units for Broward County. It was uh, more than uh, uh, nine months later that she also sought units for Dade County, at which time I then knew her and I also did talk to the Dade County uh, uh, personnel. These, um, Swayze at that point owned partic a particular property, had options on property. What was the status of the, no the post-development? I have no well, idea. Well, what did they ask you to do? 
She said that it was impossible to get through the regulations, that she started in terms of let's focus on the need. Is there anything that you can do to present better the case for Broward County than it's been done up to date? Neighboring counties are getting units. Broward for three years has gotten none. And this is Swayze that you're talking to? Yes. Th th that's, that's who's making this representation, not She Broward. is making these representations, and I say, I want to talk to the local housing authority who says uh, Sweezy is really a very good developer. She has run good units within our jurisdiction, and we do need help. I wish you would help us. But your client throughout was the realty company, not the housing authorities. The person paying our fee was the uh, realty company. Well, you made a distinction between who you're representing and who was paying the fee. Well, I think fee. they were both beneficiaries of, the, uh, of our effort. Well, but they have somewhat differing interests. Uh, that is, that the housing authority has an interest that is to respond to the need in its community and to secure units in general, and then to contract them out. The particular uh, realty firm wants funds for its development, not just funds in general for, for the county, correct? I understand that. So you were representing the interest of the, of the realty company? Yes, but all I, all I undertook to do was to try to get units for Broward County. I did not try to get units for a particular project, nor did I know whether she had a particular project. But when you went, when you went to HUD, um, who did you say you were representing? I said that I am representing a developer who was working closely with Broward County Housing Authority, and I had talked to the Broward County Housing Authority, and I then uh, made the best case I could on need, having collected the demographics and the uh, immigration, the problems that they had, and tried to make a case. The other thing I tried to do was to explain to Broward County, and I did that, how to make an application. You know, there are five categories. It was, it was very confusing because, as you know, Congress lifted in 1987 the fair share requirements. Under, Actually, 1984, fiscal 84. But we were in 1987. Okay. It was list, lifted, as I understand it, year by year. That's correct. So you didn't know until the appropriations bill came out whether it was in or out. It correct. was a per year lifting. This was a great confusion in the Housing Authority because they didn't know if there would be units and how many there would be because of the uncertainties of funding, but in addition, they didn't know how they'd be distributed. When I looked at the application that had been filed earlier before I had gotten involved with Broward, I thought it wasn't a very good application. And uh, I, to my way of thinking, there should have been a much greater description of need, but also you have to deal with the regulations where there are the categories that you have to cover uh, as to the local housing authority's capacity to handle the units, how many units you've gotten before, what your financial capacity is, and then the tiebreakers. And so what I was trying to do, and I did write them a memorandum as to how I would fill out an application, was to answer those questions for it. So I actually had correspondence with the local housing authority, also with the client gathering demographics, but I didn't get into the nitty gritty of her particular project, and she was anxious to get units to Broward County. And what was the, uh, the confusion of which you speak is, is still a confusion before, in the testimony before this committee as to the applicability of those very regulations that you're talking about. We've had testimony both ways as to whether or not those were being applied. What, what was the, you were doing this in 1987, the, all of this work? 1987 and nine, I worked about uh, 16 months on this project. 1987, starting right in, uh, I think she came into the office in uh, uh, late August. So September, I remember I got a letter from the Broward Housing Authority uh, before I made any representation or agreed to handle her work. And, but that's right at the change of the fiscal year, and there was confusion as to whether or not units would be available, whether Broward had a chance, and what was the process by which the distribution would occur. 
not to mention the funding. And so I was calling around to find out, would there be funding? Was the administration in favor of it? Was there a tangle with OMB? Was Congress in favor of the program? What regulations would apply? Uh, it seemed to me when I looked at the regulatory scheme that although you lifted the fair share regulations with respect to the overall statute, that there were regulations under the specific programs that might have been used to fair share. So my advice to Broward was you ought to do both. You ought to make a very good case on need with demographics, and you ought to also act as if the fair share is going into place because if you have a uh, evaluation committee, you don't know what criteria will be captivating to, uh, if it's not fair shared, what will be most uh, interesting. Now, when um, at, the, at the end of the process, there were, there were two proposals that your client made for uh, one of which received funding and one of the which did not. Is that correct? Well, both of them, uh, units were issued to Broward, 233, and 75 were uh, issued to Dade. Uh, my understanding from talking to the Broward director is that there were only uh, really two eligible uh, applicants for the Broward and uh, that there wasn't a real choice that only my client had the capacity to uh, to go forward and that she was the winner there and Dade I've heard both ways I just haven't had a time to check on it one was that they uh, issued them to someone else another was that they haven't been issued at all but all I can tell you is that uh, uh, the development company didn't get them and who primarily did you deal with at HUD in, in, uh, in promoting the case uh, for, you didn't actually prepare the application, you made suggestions to the two housing authorities on how to prepare their applications? Right, and wrote a memorandum as and they, to the, the, how the weighting would be, uh, a, sort of a, a, a blueprint, if you will, as to how a, an application might be presented. And I uh, also talked to Mr. Demery about uh, the merits, but he referred me to his assistant, Chris Oliver, and I talked to her at length about what process they would use for selection. I also talked to the regional administrator because I thought that if they were fair shared, it would go to the regional administrator to say, why have you not selected this county? I mean, uh, have you not heard of this need? And I also talked to the local HUD office and said, uh, is this not, uh, you know, what's wrong with this county? Why are they not getting into the uh, process? But Dade County received a lot of allocations yeah. and prior to this time, correct? That's right. That's right. So you didn't need to do that kind of work for Dade County? No, I'm, most of my effort was for Broward County. And when you spoke to Mr. Demery and Ms. Oliver, who did you say you were representing? I said, I'm trying to get some units for Broward County. There is a reputable developer down there who is anxious to proceed, and they haven't gotten any units for three years. And, did and they then I described the need. Yeah, did they ever say to you? I wrote a letter also explaining the need and showing the influx of immigration and sent it to HUD. Did to anything the they ever Demer. said suggest any sensitivity to the difference between a developer and a housing authority as to who was appropriately should be there asking for units? No. So, I mean, it, it, as you well know, these are, as you've described in your own testimony, these, these units are really available to housing authorities, and yet all of the advocacy that we're hearing about is by developers. I think that, I think that as the fair share uh, regulations were lifted and they became discretionary, it seems to me that, they bec that the housing authorities worked with developers and that the developers were pushing the system. Uh, you know, I didn't reflect on it very much at the time, but uh, uh, because we were representing uh, what I thought was a very good and needy cause, but, uh, uh, and we were working hand in glove with the, with the uh, Broward County Housing Authority. But once again, as we discussed in the earlier case, I would assume you can see how this hand in glove between developers and housing authorities removes the major check on competitive selection uh, in that entire system. I agree with that. No further questions. Thank you very much, Congressman Schumer.
Are any of my colleagues interested in asking any further questions? No, Mr. Chairman, but it's clear to me now that they should have made Martin Sheen mayor of Beverly Hills instead of Santa Monica, and then he would have welcomed people from outside Beverly Hills, and we wouldn't have had that problem. Um, Secretary Hills, uh, before I make a concluding observation, is there anything you would like to say beyond all of the things you have said? Well, I thank you for the manner in which you have handled this hearing. I appreciate your courtesy, and I appreciate the attention that all of the members have given to me, and thank you. Well, let me say, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, I promised you a full and fair hearing. I hope you feel you have received one. And uh, while I take uh, Jack Kemp at his word that he's not going to take the National Football League job, should he change his mind, I would be pleased to have you uh, apply for that job because you do a fine job as health secretary again. We want to thank you for your appearance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very gracious of you. The next witness is uh, Mr. Hunter Cushing former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multi-Family Housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Mm -hmm. We'll take a two-minute recess before we ask Mr. <coughs> Cushing to come up here so we can... Mr. Cushing, if you'll please stand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah. Please be seated. For the record, will you identify the two individuals with you? I'm accompanied by Jamie Gorelick and uh, Randall Turk. We are pleased to have both of you. Uh, if you have any prepared statement, uh, Mr. Cushing, it will be entered into the record in its entirety. Otherwise, you may proceed in your own way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had anticipated being prepared to testify today about the activities of the Department of Housing and Urban Development that are the subject of the subcommittee's inquiry. I thank the chairman for the extra time he granted me two weeks ago to prepare. At the same time, the subcommittee made clear its desire for precise and particular answers to their questions. Given the breadth of the department's activities in the multifamily housing area and the apparent and growing scope of matters under review, my counsel has been unable to advise me that I would not be placed in jeopardy by testifying. In these circumstances, until I have had an opportunity to review all the transactions that may be discussed and the relevant HUD records I have decided to follow my counsel's advice and assert my Fifth Amendment rights in response to questions concerning activities at HUD. I hope to be able to testify at the appropriate time. Well, Mr. Cushing, um, I'd like to explore this rather unusual uh, uh, pleading with you a bit. First, as you know, uh, in order for you to assert uh, your privilege under the Fifth Amendment, you will need to decline answering a specific question, and I shall now proceed to ans ask you to answer a specific question. What is your current position with the government of the United States? My current position, Mr. Chairman, is at the Department of Commerce. Mr. Mr. Cushing, what was your position at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and when did you begin your service with the Department of Housing and Urban Development? I respectfully declined to answer based on my Fifth Amendment rights. Mr. Cushing, the Chair would like to be certain that we all understand what you are saying. 
in an earlier instance when um, Ms. Uh, Dean asserted her Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, I indicated that we will do our utmost to obtain for her any documents that she felt were necessary for her to testify before the subcommittee, and we have diligently pursued that promise. Uh, is it uh, your request that the subcommittee obtain specific documents for you so that you may, when we next call you, be able to testify? And is your counsel prepared to submit a list of documents that you feel you need to testify? Mr. Chairman, would you please uh, uh, recognize my attorney, Ms. Garlick? I'll be happy to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have indeed requested a substantial number of documents from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, we have two problems that have led us to give, up, give the advice we have given to Mr. Cushing. One is the fact that we have received only a few of the documents that we have requested, and we would appreciate the chairman's and the committee's assistance in that regard. <clears throat> Second, we have asked, uh, because of the breadth of activities that were under Mr. Cushing's uh, area of responsibility at the department uh, and the number of transactions that he could potentially be asked about, uh, we have asked each member of the panel to give us specifics, if there are any, as to which he would be questioned. Today we have received very few specifics and are thus unable to prepare him, I believe, adequately uh, to testify or for me to form an opinion as to his uh, potential jeopardy. And therefore, what I would say in answer to your question, Mr. Chairman, is we would appreciate any assistance you could give us in obtaining the documents. Uh, I would not promise, however, that I would give Mr. Cushing different advice upon review of the documents. Uh, Ms. Karelik, let me tell you what my view is of your request. As in the case of uh, Ms. Deborah Gordon, uh, I promised and I diligently pursued that promise in attempting to obtain any and all relevant documents that she felt were necessary for her to testify. And I shall do so with respect to your client. At the conclusion of this uh, hearing, I shall telephone Secretary Kemp to obtain his personal assurance that your reasonable request will be met. I have to say, however, that we will need to differentiate between a bona fide and legitimate request for specific documents that your client is fully entitled to, to prepare his testimony, and a blanket request for all documents relating to all cases and all matters that during his service at HUD he had any even tangential relationship with, because that clearly is not feasible. It would probably amount to truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of documents. And um, you realize every bit as well as I do that this would be an unreasonable request. So let me ask you to be specific. Are there specific documents relating to specific transactions? that you are asking me to assist your client in obtaining? Or are you making a blanket request? Uh, we have filed a fairly specific Freedom of Information Act request as to which we have had very partial return. And as new transactions that Mr. Cushing had some involvement in emerge from the hearings, we have supplemented uh, that that request. Our request then is quite specific. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you a question? I'll be very happy to yield to my friend. I know in the case of Ms. Dean, you and the committee staff were apprised of the request and asked to help. Had you previously been asked by Mr. Cushing or his counsel to help them get documents from HUD? No, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you. So apparently what we have here is a uh, request on the basis of which they say they had to testify, but they never told the subcommittee. They never asked for our help in doing it. And uh, I will speak later on my own time about my skepticism, but I think it is relevant that at no point did they ask this subcommittee for any help in getting any of these documents, apparently. And we haven't, seen, we haven't even seen the request, I'm informed by, uh, by counsel. If I might, Mr. Chairman, we have not had resistance from HUD uh, to supplying the documents. Rather, we have, it, in the ordinary course, they have just not supplied them in a speedy manner. When did you As ask I, for them from HUD? Uh, we've had several requests. I don't know the dates, but certainly within the first week of uh, my representation of Mr. Cushing shortly, uh, shortly after our initial hearing. Uh, but as I, as I indicated, we have two problems. One is the lack of documents, and the other is the lack of notice, really, of all of the transactions as to which he might be asked questions. And all I'm saying is that uh, I am unable at this time to advise him that he would not be in jeopardy from his testimony. Well, uh, for the record, counsel, the chair would like to state that we do not provide, nor is it reasonable to expect this subcommittee to provide all conceivable questions that all members of this subcommittee and our distinguished visitors from the Banking and Housing Committee might choose to ask questions about. As a matter of fact, just last Friday, we had two former high-ranking officials of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Ms. Wiseman and Ms. Hale, who probably had a range of issues that they dealt with no smaller in scope than your client. And uh, they appeared before this subcommittee, uh, which attempted, as it always does, to conduct this hearing in a civilized fashion. We are not asking on behalf uh, of your client perfect recall of every transaction and of every document. But we do not believe that his services at HUD is any different from the service of, say, Ms. Wiseman and Ms. Hale. Your client is fully within his rights of asserting his Fifth Amendment privileges. And the chair would like to state that your clients invoking the Fifth Amendment uh, should lead to no conclusion of any kind uh, on the part of either members of this committee or the public at large. Congressman, Con I'm sorry. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Frank. Chairman, I want to express my complete disagreement with the suggestion that there was any valid basis for this witness refusing to testify other than his undoubted right to avoid the possibility of self-incrimination. He's invoked that. He is entitled to that. The notion that he can't testify because he didn't get documents is a sham, intellectually. The notion that he can't testify because he has not been told in advance all the questions is a sham. This is not one of the quiz shows of the 60s, as counsel suggested, where contestants were told the answers in advance to build up the tension. No one has been held before this subcommittee to an unreasonable standard. People who have said they could not recall, that was the way their answer stood. In this case, there were, as I understand it, at least two interviews with this witness. At the first time, he was given extra time. The notion that because he will not be able to answer in specific detail every possible transaction, he therefore must plead his self-incrimination is nonsense, literal nonsense. It does not have any logical connection between the fact asserted and the action taken. He has, for whatever reason, concerns that if he were to testify accurately and to the best of his recall, which is all he would be asked to do, that he might incriminate himself. That's a fact that stands. The notion that somehow it was somebody else's fault, that, that he wasn't told questions in advance, he has asked for treatment that no witness gets, no witness is entitled to, no member of Congress gets. None of us in this life ever has a right to know everything someone might ask us about. Part of it is, and I have found in these situations, I wind up often asking questions which I had not known I was going to be able to ask. One listens to the testimony, one listens to issues, and they arise. 
Uh, Secretary Hills mentioned a letter today that we hadn't previously known about, and we asked her about it. Uh, Ms. Cushing was there, and we are also, let's be clear, we are not talking here about 1962. We are talking about events of the late 1980s, the mid and late 1980s. We're not talking about things that happened long ago. And so I flatly disagree that there is any legitimacy, and I also think that it, it, it's uh, very clear here that we're talking about Mr. Cushing's decision. Council has spoken and she has a right to, and council said that she wasn't able to prepare him. Well, Mr. Cushing is a sentient human being capable of holding high positions in government. Uh, he should not have to be, quote, prepared, unquote, by others to answer truthfully about the important subjects that are before this subcommittee. And others who have served in positions comparable to him uh, have, have done it, and when they said they didn't remember, that's where it was left. So we are again back to, uh, it is not advice of counsel, it's not anything but his own fears which he's entitled to have, that he might be incriminated if he told the truth about what he can remember about his activities of two and three and four years ago, uh, that we have it before us. And I would like at this point to yield to my colleague from New York, uh, because we had discussed this possibility when we had been alerted to it. Yeah. I would uh, first say I agree with the gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, I think that everyone on this committee would defend your right to take the Fifth Amendment on the grounds it may incriminate yourself. But it really is, is not appropriate, fair, or decent to then say it's because of lack of documents or because you wouldn't get the questions in advance. As your own counsel stated, even if you got all the documents, however many they may be, even with the committee's generosity and indulgence, two weeks ago of asking you to get those documents, you still might do this. So let's come clean. Let's not set up these, particularly the suggestion that you have, that every witness has to get all questions in advance in order to properly prepare. I've never heard that before in the 15 years that I have been uh, in government. And I would say to you, Mr. Cushing, on behalf of Mr. Frank, and uh, Mr. Morrison and myself, if you are going to, if you're not able to answer the questions truthfully, which is your right as a citizen, then you ought to step down from your position right now in the Commerce Department. We understand that as a private citizen, you have every right to do that. We believe that government officials have a higher and stronger right, and on a letter that will be sent out today by Mr. Frank and Mr. Morrison and myself, we are going to ask the Secretary that you temporarily step down until this committee has been able to deal with these allegations or until you decide to meet your obligation as a government servant uh, to, to, to answer these kinds of questions. Mr. May I respond to you what Mr. Shaw? You certainly may, Mr. Cushing. Um, I have been serving, as I stated, at the Department of Commerce. I have asked to be and have been placed on administrative leave without pay. That is my current status. Secondly, I would hope that no adverse inference would be drawn from the assertion of my constitutional rights. Moreover, I'm only declining to testify at this time after I have had an adequate opportunity to review the relevant documents and transactions I hope to be in a position to testify. Congressman Wilkins. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to momentarily yield to my friend. Mr. Chairman, he's declined to testify at this time. He declined to testify two weeks ago. And he has not simply declined to testify at this time with some suggestion that it was called up unexpectedly. He has been given a general idea of the area in which we wish to testify. And so the implications of his last statement seem to me to be untrue. Uh, this is the second time he's refused to testify, uh, with uh, the staff and the chairman having given him uh, additional time to look at it. I did want to ask him, he said administrative leave. Uh, could I just ask, is that, is that to be, when, how long is he going to be on administrative leave? And uh, what does administrative leave mean? Mr. Chairman, would you again recognize uh, Ms. Garland? Council. Uh, Mr. Cushing is on administrative leave without pay for 30 days with the issue to be revisited at the end of that period. That's a 30-day leave. And it began when? Pardon me? It began when? Uh, last Monday. And would the gentleman yield? Yes. This is 
request by Mr. Cushing yes. to the secretary, yes, and the secretary agreed to it. That's correct. For 30 days. Yes, that's correct. Congressman Lukens. I'd be happy to, but I'd just like to finish my quick statement because the gentleman's next in line. Um, I'm a little, I'm not quite as emotive and I guess anxious as some of my friends, but I too am really deeply concerned by the fact that we were looking forward to testimony in order to wrap this whole issue up from this standpoint. We have days and hours and months. Uh, the chairman is pushing us aggressively and we just have you know, an endless schedule. I agree with Mr. Frank totally that the second reason you give to me is without base because every one of us faces these issues all the time without being able to be prompted by questions in advance. You certainly know what areas we're going to go into. You had a specific area of responsibility at HUD. To the point, I'm not aware of all the background cooperation and degree of communication between you, your counsel, and our staff. I know that something's going on. And I would much prefer to, much prefer to have been apprised in advance that when you came you were not yet ready to testify than being apprised at a public meeting that you're not yet quite ready to testify because you've had days to know that you did not have, from your own statement, the proper, proper amount of adequate documents uh, to deal with so you could logically and fairly defend yourself. Um, I'm a little mixed. I, I, would, I would like to be, I guess, as angry as everybody else because I'm frustrated. I'd really like to get at this. On the other hand, if you have a case to present that you really need documents, I would hope that the chairman, the staff, could elicit from you in the immediate future a date certain on which we can rely. Uh, Before we reach the conclusion, uh, I'd like some clarification from Mr. Cushing and counsel as to what his intention is with regard to the second ground which counsel stated, because it seems to me that if, in fact, the position is that unless Mr. Cushing receives the, re the questions in advance that the, this panel, that this subcommittee is going to ask, uh, before, or he will not testify, then we never have to get to the first question at all. Uh, and uh, because I think that that, that that really is an absolutely baseless uh, grounds for seeking to uh, assert any kind of right against self-incrimination. Yeah. Full agreement with the gentleman from New York. Uh, the chairman will cooperate uh, uh, with the council in facilitating the request for documents as long as that request is within reason. And I do need to underscore council that uh, this subcommittee is extremely accommodating to all witnesses as long as the subcommittee is convinced that the witnesses are proceeding in good faith. And if specific requests are made for specific documents available at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I am convinced Secretary Kemp will make those available. Mr. But, I, but I would like to state uh, for the record that the chairman will not entertain any frivolous request on the part of this witness or any future witness in terms of members of the subcommittee needing to submit to the witness all questions that they might ask during the course of a congressional investigative hearing. I view that request absurd and frivolous. And for the record, for myself, I reject that request. Mr. Congressman Frank. I do not believe I'm not the world's greatest expert in criminal law, but I don't believe anybody has ever been even indicted, much less convicted, for having honestly said to a question, I don't know or I don't remember. So the notion that you've got to get the questions in advance to be able to avoid incriminating yourself, if you intend to testify honestly and are not worried about what you did, it's just nonsense. Congressman Kyle. Mr. Chairman, I don't uh, want to say anything other than to uh, emphasize uh, with Mr. Cushing and counsel that the chairman's remarks, I think, go for both sides of the aisle here. The chairman has been very accommodating to requests of this nature. Uh, there is a limit to that, but uh, I think you can expect that. And uh, I think that there will be plenty of time available to obtain the information that you want based upon what the chairman has told you. Congressman Shays. Deborah Gordeen uh, took the Fifth Amendment she opened my eyes to the possibility that while she may not have been involved in any criminal wrongdoing, she was aware of, or possibly aware of criminal wrongdoing, and I just think it's a very obvious relationship that 
really a close associate of hers, uh, would also choose to, to take the Fifth Amendment. And um, I just want to uh, say um, that the remarks made by Representative Frank um, express my feelings in total. Uh, and also that uh, if a letter goes out to ensure that uh, uh, you're not in that office until you come before this committee, I would be uh, eager to sign it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Weiss. Mr. Chairman, may I then put the question to Mr. Cushing and to counsel? Because I really want on the record, do you intend to pursue uh, the second grounds which counsel stated for refusing to answer questions on the, on the grounds of self-incrimination, to wit, that you require the subcommittee to, and its members to present to you the questions that we're going to ask in advance. Uh, yes. Mr. Weiss, or Mr. Chairman, uh, may my counsel yes. respond to that? The, uh, the request for the transactions that might be the subject of questions was not a sine qua non of Mr. Cushing's testimony. It was not a requirement of his testimony. We were not asking for the questions in advance. Rather, in, to, uh, to allow me to advise him whether he had vulnerability, I wanted to know the transactions about which he would be questioned. Now that, it would simply, I, w I was asking for that in an attempt to expedite matters. I fully understand uh, if, if responses are not forthcoming, we will make the decisions on the information we have available to us. So the answer to your question is no. We are not insisting on that as a, a at all as a uh, as a requirement of his appearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, counsel, I would like to have for the record uh, you or Mr. Cushing formally withdraw that request. Uh, it is formally withdrawn. Is there any further, Congressman Schumer? Well, I'm, I'm glad it's withdrawn because it just struck me as a proposal that was too cute by half. The one thing I would say, I think you did the right thing um, by asking for administrative leave. I would hope that as long as you are not able to testify before this committee because of Fifth Amendment rights, you would ask that that leave be extended uh, permanently. And in the interim, we will make our request of the Secretary. So it would be that way. Thank you. Is there any other comment any of my colleagues would like to make? Uh, Mr. Cushing, uh, as I indicated, I will call Secretary Kemp to uh, request that he facilitate any reasonable request for materials and documents you may have submitted. The subcommittee would like to get a copy of your request to HUD so we know what, in fact, you have requested and make a judgment about its reasonableness. Uh, you are notified that you will be called as our first witness at the first hearing following the August district work period. Uh, you are dismissed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please. On behalf of myself, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Martin, the conference, this is not relevant to you, the conference on the SNL bill is going on. That's why we're going back and forth. And I'm we, glad we you mentioned that. that the hearings will be resuming in September because some of our viewers might be getting withdrawal symptoms in August, so <laughs> they'll get back in in all of September. The, the next uh, witness will be Mr. John Allen of Boston, Massachusetts. Mr. Allen, if you'll come up to the witness stand, please. your right hand, please. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. <clears throat> we could close the door, please, before we begin. For the record, Mr. Allen, you appear voluntarily. We appreciate your cooperation with the subcommittee. Your entire prepared statement will be entered into the record. You may proceed in your own way. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sit <coughs> up to you, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, my name is John Allen. <clears throat> I hold degrees uh, from Yale College and the Yale School of Architecture. I've been an architect and a developer for 20 years, and for most of that time, I've been involved in renovating and rehabilitating historic structures as part of government programs to provide low and moderate income housing. I and the company of which I'm president have done numerous projects, mostly in New England. I have provided the subcommittee staff with some of the write-ups of the award-winning projects which we have developed and which we own. I'm appearing voluntarily and willingly to assist the committee, subcommittee, in its investigation of certain HUD projects and activities. In some areas, I can provide answers to questions that have been raised. In others, I have no knowledge about things uh, that seem to be happening behind the walls of HUD. Durham Hosiery Mill was originally built in 1902. At the time, it was the largest hosiery mill in the world. It was and is an extraordinary structure which is on the National Register of, his of Historic, <coughs> excuse me, historic Places, in part because of an early example of a business uh, managed uh, by blacks. The Durham Hosiery Mill turned a series of hosiery mill project turned a series of buildings from a dilapidated condition and a blighting influence on a very large neighborhood to a successful housing project for the elderly. It, too, has won awards and plaudits and was ranked first in its section in, in the UDAG uh, competition. It is 100% occupied. I'm supplying the subcommittee with copies of just some of the articles praising the project. I also want to state that it would have cost almost as much to have torn everything down and built uh, standard garden apartments from the ground up. I first became involved in the project in late 1978. It took seven years and the investment of three quarters of a million dollars of my company's money before the project was approved in 1985. During those seven years, I met many dedicated and talented professionals at HUD. From time to time, however, some did not do their homework. Others, if I may say so, refused to exercise vision and consider anything out of the ordinary. This type of attitude perhaps would have torn down the Union Station or the uh, old post office building on, speculative a on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and put up a speculative building instead. In most cases, the HUD personnel <coughs> raised important objections and made real, <coughs> excuse me, real contributions to the success, of the success of the project. For example, there was a hazardous waste problem. Uh, it's been referred to as toxic chemical, but it's hazardous waste. The problem was identified in 1981, a removal plan was approved by the state in 1982, and the waste was removed in 1985. Uh, this, uh, the removal was approved by the North Carolina Department of Human Services, the only body with jurisdiction over the problem because it was not big enough uh, to uh, not concern federal officials but to get over the threshold for federal uh, action. The area office of HUD was kept, were kept in form and writing, and the document should have been part of the HUD file on the project. And I understand in 1985, a HUD career employee has been quoted as citing a toxic chemical problem. Uh, the documents relating to the plan and the cleanup uh, are attached to this statement. I hope the subcommittee recognizes this as an example of the failure to do homework. Another alleged problem was noise from a nearby railroad track. In, 19, in uh, early 1982, one HUD career employee described the track as an active, quote, active railroad 40 feet from building with heavy commercial traffic, end quote. The fact is that there is only one train a day, and it travels at less than five miles an hour. The issue was easily resolved. The plans and specifications at that time called for triple glazing at our expense. I believe in the end that HUD found that it did not even meet the threshold for uh, special uh, architectural uh, treatment. You've also been told that the project was exp uh, expensive. It was not a cheap project, and it's not a cheap product. It's well done, and for the federal government, the city of Durham, and the, and the people got their money's worth. Another alleged problem was that the neighborhood in which the mill stood was not a good one. But that is the point of this project. It is precisely the role of HUD to provide support for projects that the private sector cannot, will not build on its own. An entire neighborhood has now been turned around by the mill project. In fact, there are 120 units of new private residential housing under construction across the street from the mill. The city of Durham has been a major and consistent bank backer of this uh, project since 1979, including substantial city funds 
uh, for the surrounding neighborhood and the taking of over one dozen unanimous or near unanimous votes in support of the project. They are very pleased, as are the 200 elderly people who live there now at rents that are uh, 30 to $305 a month. I've supplied the uh, subcommittee with supportive letters from the city of Durham. The city has chosen to also send that letter to Secretary Kemp. Getting this project approved was a long and arduous experience. At various times, it was approved by HUD and, in fact, was funded in February of 1982, only for us to find in September that our funding had been with, uh, suddenly and inexplicably withdrawn. We were back to square one, and because of a, tr <clears throat> a turnover and changing programs, we had new people at HUD that we had to educate about the project. In the seven years between 1978 and 1985, I've never wavered in my dedication to the project. I've put in hundreds, if not thousands, of hours, not to mention committing hundreds of thousands of dollars of my company's money. I enlisted the help of everyone I could, Durham city officials, elected federal officials, including, over the years, three senators uh, and several uh, congressmen from North Carolina, community leaders, HUD career, non-career personnel, consultants, and anyone else who might help us in the city of Durham get the project built. To the best of my knowledge, I act, acted the way the law and the most stringent ethical code of which I'm aware told me I, have, uh, I should have acted. I'm anxious that the committee have a clear and accurate view of the hosiery mill. It's a project that many of us are very proud of. I hope I can be of assistance to the subcommittee and I'm prepared to answer whatever questions you may have. Mr. Allen, this project uh, cost the federal government, in terms of tax expenditures, $16.7 million. Is that correct? I, I cannot uh, verify that, that, that. Well, let me try to help you. The mod rehab amount received was $11.2 million. Is that correct? If that's the correct number, sir, it's over 15 years. Well, all of these are over 15 years. The UDAG grant received was 2.2 million, is that correct? 2.265. And the historic tax credits received by you was 3.3 million? Yes. So if you add these three items, the, the tax expenditure for the taxpayer was $16.7 million, is that correct? Uh, yes, that would be correct. That would be correct. Yes, I, if I may, sir. Please. Um, I do understand the, uh, your analysis of the numbers. Uh, of course you do. The um, uh, mod rehab uh, is a number that, if there was a conventional private market for apartments in this neighborhood, would come from tenants' income. But the, because the tenants who, can af who want to live in this neighborhood cannot afford to pay market rate, that's why uh, the mod rehab program is. Uh, in this project. Now, that is absolutely correct. That's the essence of the mud rehab program. You make the statement in your prepared testimony that the rents run from $30 a month. Isn't that correct? That's the tenant, what the tenant pays, 30 to 305. That's right. Well, if the tenant pays $30, how much does the federal government pays on that apartment? Oh, probably $375. So if the tenant pays $30 and the federal government pays $375, then there is a tax expenditure yes, involved. I, I, and if I, I were you, I wouldn't debate it. I, I'm not debating the issue, sir. Okay. So the federal government, the taxpayer, you and I, all the rest of us, have put $16.7 million into this project. Is that correct? Have or will, yes. I'm sorry? Well, have or will, yes have or will, yes. that is correct. And the question is not whether this is a worthwhile project. I'm happy to stipulate that it probably is a worthwhile project because it provides housing for low-income individuals. The question is whether in $25, then there is a tax expenditure yes, involved. I, I, and if I, I were you, I wouldn't debate it. I, I'm not debating the issue, sir. Okay. So the federal government, the taxpayer, you and I, all the rest of us, have put $16.7 million into this project. Is that correct? Have or will, yes. I'm sorry? Well, have or will, yes. Have or will, yes. that is correct. And the question is not whether this is a worthwhile project. 
I'm happy to stipulate that it probably is a worthwhile project because it provides housing for low-income individuals. The question is whether in the scheme of things, in terms of all of the requirements for federally subsidized housing in the nation, this was the most meritorious project to fund. That's the question that HUD should have decided, and that's the question that this committee is attempting to answer. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, as I read your testimony, um, you began this project in 1978. That's correct. And after a lot of effort, the expenditure of money on, on your part, the part of your company, you finally decided that it won't fly unless you hire someone with political influence to spring loose the units that you needed to proceed with this project from HUD. Is that correct? Uh, if I may, sir. Uh, Please. We uh, started in the project, yes, in very late 78. Uh, we entered uh, in 1980 a competitive, uh, we, we responded to a NOFA, which was the competitive way that the new construction sub rehab program was operated. We, at that time, had several other projects that we were just finishing up very successfully under that same competitive uh, program. We were obviously satisfied and, uh, and happy to participate in that program. The uh, NOFA was canceled, uh, and having invested something at that time, having had the site rezoned and having the city, having the city at that point uh, committed three and a half million dollars to the surrounding neighborhood, we took another for the record, NOFA means Notice of Funding Availability. Availability, yes. Okay. Yes, it's a competitive. Okay. Uh, it's the way the program used to work, and I'm sure lots of people would say it's the way it should work. That's right. Um, would, do you think that's the way it should work? Yes, in, in most cases. In most cases. Well, in what cases shouldn't it work on a competitive basis? I, I just think that there needs to be, uh, in fact, <laughs> I'm coming to that. I think in some, there needs to be a, a provision for some uh, judgment. Uh, that uh, there may be overriding needs for a project that aren't addressed in the NOFA's uh, ranking techniques. But that would be something that's entrusted to the, uh, the department. In any event, when that was assuming, can Assuming that the discretionary decision-making is predicated on merit and need and extraordinary yes. circumstance and not on political influence. That's correct. You would agree with yes. that? Okay, yes. Go ahead. In 1981, uh, uh, excuse me, probably in the end of 1980, early 1981, we asked the department, the Greensboro office, to maintain our preliminary application on file while we uh, tried to make the case, uh, or and, to, and for them to ask uh, uh, through channels uh, consideration of the project under the discretionary fund, uh, which was a small uh, fund at that time, I gather. Uh, and we spent the next uh, uh, several months trying to work that out with the department, both in uh, Greensboro and uh, in uh, uh, Atlanta. Now, we uh, did retain the service of, a, of a, a, a man who was involved, as I understand it, and I don't think I perhaps did at the time, was involved with some uh, aspect of the, I guess, 80 campaign. He was in the real estate business. He was an appraiser. He was knowledgeable about the business we were in. We asked him to assist did us. Did you employ the individual you're talking about is Mr. Lou Kitchen? No. Whom did you hire? It was uh, Mr. Point? Brubaker. I'm sorry? Uh, Mr. Harold Brubaker. Who is he? He is a... Uh, state senator? He, I believe, is a state representative. In North Carolina? In North Carolina. And he was on retainer with you? I can... Uh, I think he was either on retainer... I. Uh, a lot of our records are, as you might expect, in dead storage, either on retainer or uh, expenses only. I, I'm not clear as to what that relationship was. And what was his assignment? Well, his assignment was to help us uh, get the, uh, uh, the flaws, if you will, that were coming out of Greensboro in our proposal corrected to help us negotiate solutions to those. To, uh, was he a technical consultant or was he a political operative? 
I would assume that he's part of uh, some of each. I mean, he was in the real estate business. He's an appraiser. Uh, he's uh, clearly in the political arena. I mean, he is a, a, a state uh, con uh, representative. Well, you received your degree in architecture from the Yale School of Architecture. Is that correct? That's correct. So you really didn't need much technical help, did you? I needed some technical help with Greensboro um, because I felt we were... Uh, you needed some political help, didn't you? Well, we can go into the technical issues because I think they are justifiably answerable and were answered technical issues. And I was un unable to uh, convince uh, or get at the discussion that I thought we were entitled to uh, on the issues. Go ahead. Uh, we, um, anyway, we, we continue to work with Greensboro and with the regional office. And in uh, February, I believe, of 1982, uh, the project was funded uh, from the discretionary fund. We then sent about, set about doing working drawings, uh, all of the things that one does uh, when uh, you're trying to get to a construction loan closing and, and all those kinds of things. In September of Go ahead. in September of '82, the uh, funding was withdrawn uh, without explanation. Uh, Obviously, quite. Uh, How did it happen to be funded out of the discretionary fund? It, it's something that a developer is entitled to ask for. And so you make a request, and, and you, I mean, in my case, our technique has always been to get what we thought were very good projects with lots of local support. Projects in the case of, of, of um, the mill, where there were overriding benefits to be uh, gained by the community and therefore I think by the department from the project going forward. So Secretary Pierce or one of his associates at HUD funded your project in 82? That's correct. Out of their discretionary That's correct. allotment? That's correct. Then they defunded it? That's right. Why did they defund it? I don't, I don't uh, did know Did you that. ask? Uh, we didn't get an answer. There are rumors, but... Whom uh, did you ask? The Greensboro office. And what, whom did you ask specifically? I don't know. At that time, I'm not sure who the area manager was, but it would likely have been the area manager. But if I had put four years of my time into a project that I am as convinced of as you seem to be of this a unique, worthwhile project, how much money did you spend by 82? It must have been three, four hundred thousand dollars. Three, four hundred thousand dollars. At the end of four years, and the expenditure of four hundred thousand dollars, you finally hit the jackpot, and out of the discretionary budget of the secretary, you are notified that your project is funded. That's correct. What month was this notification? September twenty seventh, nineteen eighty two. September twenty seven. 1982. I can see that the date is uh, timely. Uh, well, it's indelibly etched in your memory, and I understand why. It was a very, very important project for you. When were you notified that it is defunded? Oh, no, it was funded in February, I believe, 18th. February 18th, it's funded? Yes, that's in your packet. Uh, and defunded uh, September 27th. September. What did you do between February 18th and September 27th? We did what a developer normally does. And you start doing your working drawings, you negotiate contracts, right. you do your legal things. Uh, in this case, we had to go through the city and get all the approvals there. We did, you know, it's normal business. And then, then everything collapses. That's correct. And you just took it? No. We, uh, I don't know what other routes were available to us other than the one we took, but we complained, and we complained to HUD Central. Uh, to whom? I, I believe the first uh, person we talked to was a Carter Sanders. Who is Carter Sanders? He was in HUD. I don't know his uh, uh, particular role. Did you personally complain to Mr. Sanders? I attended the meeting where that complaint was made, yes. And uh, who we, else Mr. Said Kitchen that? was involved with us. In, <coughs> now we point. come to Mr. Kitchen. That's who correct. is Mr. Kitchen? Mr. Kitchen is a uh, uh, North Carolina native, uh, lives in Atlanta. He um, 
is politically active. Uh, he was introduced to us by Brubaker because they were both uh, had some role in the 80 campaign. When you say politically active, can you be more specific? I don't know. Um, I have heard that he's uh, a lot more <laughs> active than I thought he was. I don't know uh, what his titles were, but I know he was active because later on I could see um, uh, him as he pursued those activities. In fact, he had to. Well, uh, what is your current knowledge of his political activities? I don't know what his active activities are today. Well, what is your knowledge of his political activities during this entire period? Well, I know that he uh, was active in uh, the 80 campaign, presidential, and the 84, because when the 84 came, campaign uh, come on, came onto the horizon, he had to uh, modify substantially his involvement with us. Uh, no. And I was aware of him running congressional campaigns in North and South Carolina. Okay. And he's all, he's, he, uh, did you hire him as a technical expert, or did you hire him for purposes of using his political influence? Again, it would be both. He had experience in the construction business. He was in Atlanta. He uh, had some uh, acquaintance with the people in the regional office. Uh, and we needed help in getting our story told. Uh, well, his acquaintance with people in the regional office has not, not, not much to do with technical expertise, does it? Yes, because as the technical matters got, but got bumped from one office to the next, they had, we had to keep dealing with them. I mean, they ultimately got bumped to Washington, and we had to deal with them at, in, at this level, in Washington. How much did you pay, Mr. Kitchen? Uh, I've seen published reports of 25000 I, I would expect it's closer to forty. Approximately $40,000. Yeah, I believe so. And you, as a product of the Yale School of Architecture, whose judgment I would certainly accept on technical matters, how much of that $40,000 do you believe was properly earned as a technical expert? And the residual, I, the I, presume, was, was, the residual I, I presume, was earned in terms of political influence peddling. Well, I, I, I think the money was properly earned, sir. Uh, the services that, that is he, not my question. I, I you cannot are, make that allocation. Well, Mr. Allen, you will have to, because we are asking the questions here, and you are under oath. So let me remind you of that. I repeat the question. Please listen carefully. Your statement is that Mr. Lou Kitchen was hired both for his technical expertise with respect to construction and with respect to his political influence. Is that your testimony? That's correct. Your testimony is that the total amount he received is about $40,000. I believe so. That's a ballpark figure. Yes. My next question is approximately how much of the $40,000 do you feel you paid for technical expertise as a building specialist, and how much did you pay for political influence? I don't know how to make the allocation, but since you've told me to do so. That's right. 50-50? Uh, 50-50. Um, All right. The basis, I just don't know the basis for that. All right. Was he already on your payroll when the defunding came through? No, I don't believe so. So you hired him because HUD defunded your project? We hired him because the problem got more difficult and we needed some help. Yeah, well, it seems to me that as your project becomes defunded, you don't need a technical expert, but you need a political expert, don't you? Um, we had continually, uh, up through the end of 1985, the same technical issues thrown at us. And they now, let me tell you about his technical expertise. And I again want to advise you that you are under oath. I am quoting from Mr. Kitchen. I pulled all the pieces back together and helped them resubmit it. I wouldn't have known what one end of a Section 8 looked like. That doesn't sound to me like great technical expertise in the intricacies of HUD regulations. That seems to me like somebody who quite honestly says, I don't know what these things are, but maybe I have some political muscle. Doesn't that sound like that to you? 
it does with one exception. That is that he, pref he prefaced his remarks with the fact that he put the, helped us put the package back together, and that's the technical. So I, I don't mean to or need to debate, uh, you know, what part of his service we are not was. Debate, we are not debating okay. here, Mr. Allen. You are under a mistaken impression if you believe this is a debate. This is a congressional hearing. I, I do not mean to argue with you over it. That's correct. Having had your project defunded, when did it become refunded? Uh, not until, well, they canceled the program, so not only was it defunded, but then the program disappeared in uh, 1983. Uh, the project uh, did not um, get back on track for two years. Mm -hmm. And how did it get back on track? Well, in, in late 1982, uh, we uh, convinced Washington that we should get reviewed once again. As who, who convinced Washington? I did, Kitchen did, uh, the city did, uh, the congressional delegation. Who was Washington? No, I said, oh, uh, it would have been uh, the assistant secretary of staff. Is there any name you can give us? It would be uh, Abrams and uh, the staff underneath him. And we present, we this brought This is the Mr. Abrams of Denver who testified before the subcommittee? That's correct. Have you met with him? during this period? Which period? Well, that you tried to get it back on track. Yes. How many times? Um, probably four. Did Mr. Kitchen meet with him? I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, we submitted the entire uh, package to Washington uh, when they at least, uh, I guess, uh, concluded that we had an argument of fairness, they, in the period of November through February uh, 82 and 83, reviewed the entire package uh, and produced a uh, uh, list, I believe it's called technical issues that we had to satisfy uh, to make the project eligible for mortgage insurance. Why was the professional staff so vehemently against your proposal? At that time? Well, throughout. They, were, they never favored it. Well, uh, th that particular report that was put out on February 1st uh, that does, has no uh, glimmer uh, of, of that uh, attitude. But I will grant you that um, we have had difficulty with this project all the way through, starting uh, in Greensboro, where d different issues were raised. Uh, we have done projects like this in the past. Uh, we, I finally realized that Greensboro was not convinced that the project could work. However, we wanted to address the issues of hazardous waste or noise or whatever else it is that they specifically put on paper and felt we did so. And, um, and I if think you, we, if we, you oh. felt that you addressed those issues successfully, why did we get testimony from two assistant secretaries that on the basis of the advice of their professional staff with which they concurred, they continued to oppose the project. Um, I've read uh, Ms. Hale's uh, affidavit in the, in the Inspector General's uh, report where she indicates that she had sufficient material uh, and technical solutions to answer those questions. Uh, we worked, I believe, prior to that cooperatively with Ms. Wiseman uh, from uh, early 1983 to uh, early 1984. Uh, she uh, helped us try to get problems solved and the project uh, back on its feet. I, Did uh, you hear her testimony on Friday before this committee? A, a little bit of it. Yes. What was the bottom line of her testimony? That she did, uh, did not approve of the project. Uh, what did she say about the view of her professional staff with respect to this? Well, I, I don't recall, but it was not good. Well, let me tell you, I don't want to read all of the quotes, but it was devastating. The professional staff was vehemently opposed to it. Uh,
location would place elderly tenants in an unsafe neighborhood, active railroad, 150-gallon drums containing hazardous waste, The Durham, the Durham Hosiery Mill project, in my opinion, is a potential source of embarrassment for the department. Valuation section recommends rejection due to high cost, etc. Uh, she had, Ms. Wiseman, who is a very uh, gracious and cooperative lady, had a very sharp disagreement with the secretary with respect to this project. Have you heard about that? Yes. Yes. Ms. Dean told Ms. Wiseman to fund the project because the secretary wants the project funded. She said she would not. Then the secretary told her, the secretary of HUD told her, he wants the project funded. And Ms. Wiseman responded with a great deal of courage, I will not fund the project. So it's not quite the way you describe it, that all these problems were gradually resolved and then the project got funded. The project is a very serious bone of contention between the assistant secretary in whose bailiwick this belongs, and the secretary's office, Mr. Pierce, Ms. Dean. And when Ms. Wiseman leaves HUD and Ms. Hale takes her place, the first day or the first week of her being on the job, she's told to sign off on it. And she's new on the job, so first day, second day, third day she does. But then she doesn't want to sign any of the waivers that are called for. And she talks to the secretary because she's so disturbed by this. Have you met Ms. Dean in connection with this project? Yes. How many times? Two or three. Describe those meetings for the subcommittee in as much detail as you can. I, the only meeting that I've gone back through my records, uh, the only meeting uh, that I can uh, and that's why I'm not sure there's, I'm quite sure there's two, and I show a possible third meeting. Okay, the, how did you get to Miss Dean? Who gave you the well, idea? One, uh, if I might back up just for a second. Um, I, uh, you may detect some, um, uh, although I'm proud of the project we built, it was a very frustrating experience for me. And the, uh, I do have a copy of the remarks that you just touched upon. And by way of explanation of my frustration in this project, if I could just quickly well, touch. Well, let me stipulate, Mr. <laughs> Allen, that you disagree with all the professional people's judgment. You didn't think there was a, 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 a railroad nearby or that it didn't make any difference, that it was not an unsafe neighborhood, that uh, um, it is not an embarrassment to the department or it will not become an embarrassment to the department. Let me stipulate that you disagree with all of those facts. I want to get to your meetings with Ms. Okay. Dean. It's, I, sir, it's not necessarily my disagreement, but that of other people responsible, okay. state and federal uh, officials. The, um, uh, in, um, the project was, uh, seemed to have some impetus in 1984, and once again, it, uh, it, these kind of matters kept coming up. Uh, it lost its impetus. Um, I was aware of the existence of Miss Dean, I am sure, sometime in late 84. I, well, how, I, how did you find out about her? Oh, I believe her? the city had called her, um, perhaps the congressional delegation. I mean, her name was out there. Right. Uh, we were, once again, without uh, a, a place to make our argument. Uh, Mr. Abrams was gone. Um, uh, the next, Mr. Barksdale was gone. Uh, uh, Mrs. Wiseman uh, apparently had decided to leave, um, and, and, and 1984 was spent working, as I said, very cooperatively with her and her staff. I have nothing but compliments and about the way. Well, let me stop does. you there. You are highly complimentary of Ms. Wiseman's staff. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. You're also complimentary with respect to her. 
That's correct. Well, if you felt that her staff was doing such a good job, then you are certainly not saying that they had any particular animus against your project or you personally. I mean, they were cooperative. I don't think against me personally. Um, I, I think that there was uh, uh, that these issues continued to sit on the record, even though the record had been dealt with. Uh, excuse me, they were not sitting on the record. In my judgment, they were. Um, uh, uh, they had been dealt with, and yet they continued to be uh, things that came in from the field, and you can see that in some of the uh, IG's report, as problems, you better watch out. And I felt that my job was to get people who would listen to a reasonable explanation. Then they can tell me, Alan, you're wrong or you're right. But I wanted somebody to really make a decision based on the facts. Um, well, let me stop you here. You dealt with, correct me if I'm wrong, three assistant secretaries in this round with Mr. Barksdale, is that correct? Yes. Did Mr. Barksdale turn you down? He turned down the Hodag in November of 1984. Once? Just once. Mm -hmm. did, did he turn down anything else in connection Not with that you? I'm aware of. No. So Mr. Barksdale turned down uh, one of the grant requests. That's correct on the basis of his professional staff's advice? It was on the basis of technical deficiencies that was stated. We met with the staff afterwards, and um, they, uh, one of our requests had also been that there would be moderate rehab used in conjunction with that program. They were unable to underwrite the UDAG, the HODAG, including the, uh, the mod rehab income, so therefore it produced what they referred to as technical deficiencies. We reviewed that with the staff. Had that been included, the project would have been funded. It ranked high enough to be funded under that round of the HODAC yeah, program. That is what Ms. Wiseman refers to as you're getting subsidy upon subsidy upon subsidy. Is well, that correct? Two subsidies. Two subsidy upon subsidy. Yes, and you wanted to use one of the government subsidies as private money, is that correct? Well, the way the program was uh, uh, written, if it, be, if it could not be considered that way, then we had no tools to work with. But you tried to do it? Yes. Well, Does it? See, we tried to do it. Sorry? That, I believe, that's a, HODAG, that's a UDAG issue, not a HODAG issue. Well, whether it's UDAG or HODAG, these are government subsidies, right? Yes, but in terms of Ms. Wiseman, I don't think it was an issue before her. Well, she complained to the subcom subcommittee on Friday at a public hearing about this, that you folks wanted to use one subsidy, have that construed as your private funds, so you can get and qualify for a second subsidy. Yes, that was an issue for the UDAG program, not the HODAG program. I'm not disputing that. My question is, is that correct? Yes, we couldn't do the project unless that uh, finding could be made or as to that effect. Well, does it make sense to you, just in terms of ordinary common sense observation, that one governmental subsidy should be construed as your private investment, which then entitles you to a second government subsidy? Well, it, it apparently was a matter that was under review by the department at the time, and uh, we were perhaps fortunate that we asked for consideration at the same time. But the, I think the argument, which is contained in a brief, I believe, uh, is that uh, the, uh, the uh, policy uh, applied to the old new construction sub-rehab Section 8 program where the subsidy was a deep subsidy. The mod rehab program is a shallow subsidy and therefore, in our case anyway, alone was insufficient to allow us to build the project. Well, shallow subsidy is a nice phrase, but $17 million of taxpayers' money Taxpayers wouldn't consider shallow. That's a very no, generous subsidy for your yeah, project. Two shallow subsidies, which created that number. You're right. Two generous subsidies created that program. I, I don't think it will be appreciated by taxpayers to have 17 million dollars referred to as shallow subsidy. Lots of people would like much shallower subsidies just to survive. Uh, let me let me stay with this professional level turndown of your project. The professional staff advised Mr. Barksdale, Assistant Secretary, to turn down your project, correct? For technical deficiencies, yes. 
The professional staff advised Ms. Wiseman to turn down your project, correct? I only have uh, Ms. Wiseman's statement to that. Under I oath, just as you are under oath, that's correct. That's correct. I, I have no, are no you, knowledge. You don't doubt that her statement. I, I have no personal knowledge of it. Other well, than then that. you shouldn't belittle her statement. I didn't. Yes, you said the only thing you have is her statement. Her statement was given to this subcommittee under oath. I take that statement very seriously. I respect that statement. You should too. I do, sir. <clears throat> if, if I could... Well, uh, let, me, let me just pursue this. Assistant Secretary Barksdale turns down your project on the basis of his professional staff's recommendation, correct? Correct. The person who follows him in that same job is Ms. Wiseman. You have high praise for her professional staff. They cooperated with you, correct? That's correct. She cooperated with you. That's correct. You have high praise for her. That's correct. Yet on the basis of her professional staff's negative recommendation with which she concurs, she turns down your project. Is that correct? She refuses, uh, she turns down the project, that's correct. She turns down your project. And then her successor, Ms. Hale, in a very plaintive fashion, under oath, tells this subcommittee, first day I come on the job, or the second day or the third day, certainly the first week, that's her testimony. She said, I don't remember if it's the first day, but it sure was the first week. I am told by Debbie Dean to sign off, and I do. And you have to be crazy not to see that what she's saying is, I didn't want to do it, but I did it. And then she has to sign off on other things, waivers. And she feels so unhappy that she refuses to sign the waivers and goes all the way to the secretary of HUD, Mr. Pierce, to tell him how unhappy she is having to sign the waivers. Are these facts accurate? I mean, I've, 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 they've been reported, and I have no reason to doubt that they're not accurate. Well, they're more than reported. They are sworn testimony before this subcommittee. Have, yes. You have any reason to doubt the veracity of these statements? I have no reason to doubt those statements. All right. Now discuss for me, please, your discussions with Ms. Dean. At the end of, um, after my last meeting uh, with Ms. Wiseman, which, uh, was positive. Um, I, I either I learned that she had uh, decided to leave HUD, or things didn't happen. In any event, uh, I called Deborah Dean's office uh, and asked for an appointment. At some time later, I got an appointment. Uh, we went in there. Uh, Did anybody help you obtaining that appointment? Not that I know of. Although I, I would be perfectly. Uh, I mean, I can conceive that either the, the delegation or the city or somebody else who was interested in our, uh, on our behalf had, had called, but I have no, I, I can't recall any uh, particulars, any specifics. We had a meeting, a person who worked for me and I in her office on uh, February 19th, I believe it was. Who else was at the meeting? An employee, a, a man named Richardson who worked for me. And. And was Miss Dean alone, or was there yes. anybody with her? No, she was alone. She was alone. I believe and, so. I don't recall anybody with her. And there were two of you gentlemen. That's right. What did you tell her? Well, we recited once again uh, the, the difficult problems we were having and uh, that we felt that we were entitled to uh, some consideration, uh, that we had thought it was a good project. Uh, we had certainly put our reputation and our money where our mouth is. Um, it appeared that the reconsideration that uh, Ms. Wiseman had asked the city to request for the HODAG was probably not going to go anywhere. So we said, look, we don't think we have any future with the HODAG program. Um, we'd like to try to do this as a UDAG, uh, keeping the moderate. Uh, yeah. Spell out what HODAG and UDAG mean. HODAG is Ho Housing Action Development Grant. Housing Development Action Grant. Right. Housing, yeah. And UDAG is Urban Development Action Grant. These are two subsidy programs of the federal government, right? Yes. Okay. Um, 
UDAG being the older by quite some uh, amount. Um, we again sp spun out the tale of, of woe uh, that we had experienced on the project from our perspective. How long was this meeting? 45 minutes, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It. Um, uh, we asked uh, her to uh, consider that we go forward with a UDAG uh, application. The the deadline was very uh, might have been six weeks away. We said that between the staff, the city staff, and our staff, we felt we could get a, a responsible application in. She uh, uh, was uh, non-committal. Uh, the um, meeting uh, had no um, uh, anything other than a thank you very much. I'll look into it. Would, by the way, would you prepare a memorandum of your story, which we did uh, and probably submitted a week later. Um, sometime after that, um, I believe she called me, or her office called me, and I called back. I can't remember exactly how that happened, but uh, saying that uh, we think you have a point uh, on the fairness issue. We think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that uh, you're entitled to some consideration. What do you mean by the fairness issue? We felt, uh, Mr. Chairman, that and, and I can use the technical issues as a sort of the easy example of that, that we had not been, uh, that between confusion and um, lack of uh, appreciation of some of the things that we'd accomplished, that we hadn't been given a fair hearing on some of the issues. Well, let me stop you there, Mr. Allen. You describe the professional staff as being very helpful and cooperative. Is that correct? That's correct. Is it your testimony that they were so incompetent that while these were the professionals who had to deal with these items, despite their friendly and cooperative attitude, they, they came down against your project? No, sir. Uh, you can take the example of the hazardous waste, which we had, uh, had documented uh, to Greensboro. This was, uh, for reasons that I don't quite understand, not a comfortable enough level of information for central office to concur uh, with the North Carolina Human Resources Department that the hazardous waste issue had been dealt with. It was dealt with the owner of the prop by the owner of the property in 82 and 83. I felt that th the record was clear. I could not get agreement that the record was clear. What did the professional people tell you when you told them that the local people are happy with the hazardous waste issue? It, uh, they seemed to accept it. Uh, it became, I believed, a non-issue, uh, but clearly it lingered and continued to be an issue for quite some time. I had a meeting with Ms. Hale specifically on that issue. And in fact, we had to get the uh, federal EPA to write a letter finally to the department saying that you may rely on the state that it is below the federal threshold. There is a statement from one member of the professional staff who says the hosiery mill project has been a source of ill feeling in the field regarding the undue pressure applied by central office FHA staff during the UDAG review period. Another one says, with all due respect, this is a bad project. It is chock full of policy waivers and multiple subsidies. It will place low-income elderly on a site characterized by excess noise levels, a site that still contains certain levels of toxic chemicals. Did they just dream up these things? Sir, that's a, in my view, that's a misstatement. It's a very detailed misstatement. Yes. But it's and there is a whole slew of these. Yes, sir. I, I, and they're all I, mistaken. Not necessarily, but I, the hazardous waste one is clearly a mistake. And I, you are correct. There is, a, uh, there was anyway, a tension on this project that was not what we would all uh, like to have in the way in, do, in doing this business. And the reason for that tension, do you think, is because? The local people felt bullied by the central office because of the political interference? 
No, I, I uh, think it's probably several things. Uh, it, it existed when we first got in the project. There was uh, unhappiness between uh, Greensboro and the city of Durham. We saw that uh, early on, just as we were beginning to put the project together, and things didn't get any better. I mean, it, we continued to have uh, unfortunate um, uh, situations like that. So and I will, I will not deny that we, it is our style to, to push. I mean, we felt very confident that we could get this project done. We had just finished several of similar, with similar problems, and we'd done them, and we knew it could be done. And so therefore, we may not have been as sensitive, perhaps, to some staff in Greensboro, and, and may have sort of, sort of dug our own uh, hole for ourselves at the, get, at the mm -hmm. beginning of the project. Did you have a second meeting with Ms. Dean? Um, I, I, I know I do. I did. I cannot. Uh, in fact, my appointment book shows three, and I cannot remember the um, substance of them, except that uh, uh, it would have been, uh, you know, as we were working on the UDAG or closing or one of the different things like that, some discussion of a problem that, that we had. Nothing, and there's nothing in my notes to, to pinpoint any particular significance to the meetings. Is it fair to say that Mr. Pierce, through Ms. Dean, and directly overruled the judgments of the professional staff and the assistant secretaries who recommended against the project? I don't know who, um, ultimately, where the responsibility uh, for the project being approved lies. Um, I think that the UDAG it was very difficult and we had to put it over because of the environmental questions to the next round. Um, the UDAG staff wanted from the, from the FHA staff a commitment without conditions. That delayed it. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, we had to get the federal EPA to concur with the state uh, EPA on the ha hazardous waste issue. Um, I think we, I think we, you know, the record shows in the UDAG, and these, these, these things were answered, and uh, uh, I, I don't know. It was also ranked number one in the Pocket of Poverty program. I'm sorry? The Durham Hosiery Mill was ranked number one in the country in its UDAG category. Mm -hmm. So I am not privy, uh, and I do not know uh, the details of how this thing actually got done, but we did our best. And I think we, we did an okay job of t to satisfy all of the problems, objections uh, that were given to us. But you were aware of the fact that the assistant secretaries who had responsibility for the project turned it down. That's correct. And then you were aware of the fact that following your meetings with Ms. Dean, Ms. Dean or the secretary approved it. Following the meetings uh, with Ms. Dean, as I told you, she called me and said, okay, you can, you, can take a, you can put your UDAG application in, and that's when we started. And that no, was probably uh, mid-March. You never met Mr. Pierce. Never met, never spoke But you met Ms. Dean twice or three times. That's correct. Was it clear to you at any point whether she was acting on her own behalf or on the secretary's behalf? It never occurred to me to raise that question. I mean, I would think that it's an organization and it has its hierarchy and uh, whatever the chain of command is is the way things should be done and I would have expected they would have been done. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you basically saying that you are mystified that the project kept getting turned down even though you thought you had solved the various problems, technical problems that had been raised? In a way, yes. The chairman put his finger on it when he said, you know, where did, and I use the word tension, where did this phenomenon come from? And clearly it was there through the whole entire life of the project. I like what I'm trying to get at is this. I'm a little bit confused on whether or not various technical problems would be raised and then you would deal with those problems and in your mind solve them only to find another problem being raised and having then to deal with that and so forth or whether basically the problems raised 
were resolved in your mind, but for some reason the project continued to languish and you couldn't figure it out and therefore sought help. Let me take the, um, the hazardous waste one again. Well, could that, you just sort of characterize right. it generally for me to help I me out? I think generally, I think we solved the problem, documented it, submitted it. It should have either was approved or should have been approved. It was approvable. And the problem would continue to exist. I mean, the hazardous waste was removed and certified by the state of North Carolina. Two years later, we still have career staff saying that the project has a hazardous waste problem. I can't explain that. Okay. And Did that same kind of phenomenon occur with respect to other things, such as the noise, the safety, the railroad tracks, the... Um, yeah, the noise and the railroad tracks are the same issue. Yes, that's correct. By the way, what is glazing, triple glazing? Instead of, you know, thermopane, it's triple. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like my apartment in Crystal City with it's the railroad. It's just a sound right attenuation there. device. Okay. What other problems were raised that had to be solved by you in order to get approval? Well, if you want to go back to Greensboro, I mean, it was a long list of things. Term, you know, start with termites and the, the, the kinds of things you have with old buildings. All of those kinds of problems. By the time we're talking now, I believe it's it's the neighbor, the site, whether the this is an adequate place or a safe place for elderly housing. Uh, the uh, hazardous waste, noise, uh, and we had asked for a, uh, the exception rents uh, because this is an elevator building and mod rehab does not make provision for the fact that elevator buildings are more expensive than garden apartments. I, I believe those were the four issues that finally uh, got everybody its attention. All right, well, let's go through them. First of all, the ele elevator building means that the rents had to be higher because the cost was higher, right? Yeah, the, the mod, mod rehab program works at 120% of fair market value. Second, the, the, the cost itself of the project was, was a significant factor in people's minds. Yes, I do not deny that. Third was the safety element, right? Uh, whether this is a, a neighborhood in which uh, 150 apartments of elderly housing could, could uh, be happily occupied. The answer to that, which was, by the way, uh, negotiated with uh, Mr. Hip's office in 1980 uh, with the city was the city's allocation at that point of three and a half million dollars to the surrounding neighborhood. The city's argument to Mr. Hips at that time was the only way we can deal with this neighborhood is called the Edgemont neighborhood. The only way we can deal with this is to put some federal money and some low-income people into that place to get this building occupied. It's the single dominating blighting influence on the neighborhood. So that the only way to deal with the Edgemont neighborhood was to, to put some subsidized housing into that project. How did that make it more safe? Because that, with the city's three and a half million dollars, that, that's the anchor to starting the redevelopment process. What did the city do with the three and a half million dollars? Clean, cleared land, made it available to other developers. There's 120 units of market rate housing being built there right now. Habitat for Humanity has built housing. It uh, put new streets, water and sewer, uh, got rid of um, really dilapidated housing units. Uh, there, was, there were some drug problems. So it used its money to do those various things. Okay, you got the, the waiver on the elevator. There was the general cost issue, the safety issue, and what was the fourth one? Uh, the hazardous waste. Okay, and, and, you, and you assume that you got that resolved? Yes. All right, wouldn't the cost issue alone have been a reason to turn this project down? I mean, we're, uh, we're talking about 150 tenants, is that right? 150 apartments. Uh, 150 200 apartments. Tenants. And 11.2 uh, for, the, for the mod rehab, just the mod rehab part of the, uh, of the subsidies? Well, I, 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 will, I will make no defense of the expense of the project. I mean, it's ambitious. It's difficult. Uh, we had uh, uh, a large goal that we shared with the city on this project. And if you're going to deal with the Edgemont neighborhood, you had to deal with this building, and that was a large, decrepit building. The alternative would be demolition. It was well, let me just ask you if you'd stipulate this. I know you're proud of the project. That, that's evident, and you, you believe you solve problems. But, well, isn't that correct? You're yes, proud of this project, right. and, uh, and you believe you solve problems. But wouldn't you also agree that, considering the cost of it, that staff people would be perfectly within their professional judgment to recommend denial of the project yes. on the cost issue yeah. alone? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, uh, I would argue just the opposite. I mean, I argue there's reasons why you should expend the additional money, but it's certainly a legitimate argument, yes. All right. Now, I'm curious as to what really uh, got this project turned around. You said that uh, 
we convinced Washington to reinstate it. And uh, you said you talked to Mr. Abrams and people on his staff. I take it you also, in, in later answers to the chairman's questions here, we're talking about uh, contacts with uh, Deborah Dean. And uh, you alluded to some other potential contacts that others might have had, either with Deborah Dean or, or others, perhaps even including the secretary. Perhaps. Um, you said city officials, um, Mr. Kitchen, city officials, members of the congressional delegation, and yourself all worked right. on this. By the way, Mr. Kitchen basically was inactive uh, uh, during the period of the 1984 campaign. I mean, he may have so, done a few things, but... So he wasn't involved in getting the situation turned around? He was involved uh, in uh, the early part of, uh, of 84, and from time to time he would, would help, but he, I, he did not get paid during a period of time, for instance. All right. You said you enlisted the, uh, the help of everyone you could. Durham city officials. Who was the mayor of Durham? Uh, we, during our um, of course, this project, there were four mayors, but the uh, mayor at this period of time was Charles Markham. And did you uh, enlist his help? Oh, sure. He, he and the city delegation came to Washington. Uh, do you know, several times. Do you know who they might have visited with when they came to Washington? Well, I was there. Who did they visit with when they came we to Washington? We visited with Mr. Abrams, Ms. Wiseman, uh, and the staffs of both, Mr. Barksdale. Um, I, don't know, I, mean, I can go to my notes, and they were not small gatherings. But, but, but all HUD staff people that you're talking about. Did you visit with, uh, did, did you go up the hill and visit with members of the congressional delegation? Yes. Or other congressmen? Yes. Who did you visit with, do you recall? Uh, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Was, is, is Mr. Valentine not the district. representative of this district? Yes. Okay. Who um, else did you visit? We started with Senator Morgan, and then uh, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Morgan and Senator Helms. That was back in '79, and then Senator Helms and Senator East. They were all uh, we we talked to them whenever we could, and um, Senator Helms' staff, uh, more than the others, was helpful to us. Okay. And uh, any other members of Congress that you can recall? Early on. Uh, there were two or three others from North Carolina who uh, either were friends of somebody in Durham who were on committees that might be helpful. When you uh, talked with Congressman Valentine, did he indicate that he could uh, or would try to talk to people within HUD and, and try to help out? I would think so, but I don't remember specifically. Uh, I know that he attended meetings with us at HUD. His office attended meetings with us at HUD. I'm sorry? His office did attend meetings with us at HUD. People on his office staff. That's correct, yes. Attended meetings with you. One of the uh, things that you attach to the material that you gave to us is a newspaper article in which uh, it um, describes enthusiastically this project and um, says Durham's enthusiasm for recycling old buildings began about 10 years ago when Terry Sanford, Jr., then a 24-year-old fledging real estate consultant, first saw the insides of two vacant warehouses off Main and Gregson Streets, and then goes on to quote him about uh, how these empty buildings uh, uh, he thought had, uh, well, actually he goes on to talk about how, how crummy they were there, but presumably felt that uh, ultimately they had some potential for development. Uh, is that Terry Sanford, Jr. relation to yes. uh, the member of the Senate right now? Yes. His father was president of Duke University at the time. At, at the time. Yeah. Uh, wh what was his role, Terry Sanford, Jr.'s role? Well, those, those are two tobacco warehouses. They're smaller buildings, lower buildings than ours, more ornate, less windows, as you might expect a warehouse to be. And they're near the Duke campus. They're in, a, uh, in the more dynamic part of, of uh, Durham. Uh, he and, um, in fact, we use the same architect. Uh, ultimately. He and uh, another partner, and there probably were some others, um, basically took a flyer. They are uh, now retail uh, with probably some office space in them. Uh, they're quite well known. Uh, it, they have spurred the redevelopment of the neighborhood that they're in. Uh, I know that they were unable to rent the second floors as market rate housing, so those have been turned into office space. The, uh, the housing market is, is difficult in Durham. Let me just ask you one final question, if, if you know the answer to it. Um, it's been established before that Secretary Pierce was not directly personally interested in too many projects. This happens to be one in which the evidence before us is that uh, it was his order that actually made the Section 8 part of this uh, program go, uh, go forward. Um, I want you to think carefully about all of the contacts that were made from the congressional delegation, from 
city officials that you brought up here, from uh, yourself and, and anybody else, and um, just give us your best guess as to what turned this project around and why it was that he decided to, apparently, from prior evidence we have, to intervene personally and uh, okay the project, even though staff had disapproved it. You know, I wish I knew. Um, the, I, I think one thing to point out, it's important to point out, is that there were actually two UDAGs under consideration for the city of Durham at this time, and they were both being lobbied uh, by the city, by uh, different interest groups in the city. The other was, was the Civic Center, and both projects were funded. Now, I don't know whether Durham had any particular leg up, um, but it, it got not just our project, but it got two projects at the same time. I have, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, it, it didn't uh, uh, save the day, and certainly nobody's going to believe me if I, uh, I'm going to argue that the, my persuasiveness and the quality of the project and all of the spin-off values and so on that I think are the reasons for doing the project, that that was, you know, was going to carry the day. I do not know um, if there was any specific thing that uh, caused as you say, if the secretary did it, the secretary to uh, approve this project. So you don't know whether it was the persuasive force of your technical arguments overcoming the objections of the staff or uh, political pressure, um, but the project was approved. That's right. And I, I said one final question. I guess I'd make a final comment, Mr. Chairman, and, and just uh, ask you to comment if you'd like to. Uh, for 150 units, the cost of this project, uh, when you put in the tax credits and everything else, is $16.7 million, um, is an awful lot of money. And when Congress considers modifications in programs uh, to try to best spend the taxpayer dollars to solve pressing problems, we have to look at prioritization. This is what the chairman was telling you, I think, when he said he would stipulate that this may be a worthwhile project, but the question was uh, whether it was uh, the most worthy considering the amount of money available in other projects uh, around the country. Um, if you were in our position, rather than the architect uh, uh, dealing with a very challenging project, and considering the cost per unit here, and the scarce funds available and the terrific need out there, uh, wouldn't you concur that this is probably a project that was way too expensive for what the taxpayers got out of it? Um, I, I think you could, uh, I, I could uh, make a case that you should look at this as two things here. It is the preservation of a historic building. Now, there are tax credits available to do that, whether we turn it as Terry Sanford Jr. did into retail malls. I mean, they got the same benefit that we got from the tax credit, and then there's a the production of the elderly housing. And if you were to separate out those two and say this is only elderly housing, then yes, while the, I will not argue that the price isn't high anyway, but if you could separate out that and just look at this as elderly housing, then clearly that's too much money because you can build elderly housing while they're building it right across the street from us today at 60000 bucks a unit. So, so basically the cost is justified uh, on the basis, in your opinion, that two objectives were being served, not just one. Uh, yes, I mean, that's the argument I hope I've, I've no, uh, Mr. made clear that's behind us uh, on this project. Well, and, and I, I thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, it just seems to me that uh, part of our job here ought to be to uh, help to illustrate to the taxpayers of the country as well as to learn ourselves the huge cost in uh, projects such as this. And if this project is justified on the basis that it serves two purposes, historic preservation and rental, uh, I think we would be justified in concluding that these are both extremely expensive ways of achieving both of those objectives, and we might want to consider the appropriateness of, uh, of, both, of, of both programs uh, and whether uh, they could both perhaps be achieved in a, in a more efficient fashion, uh, and whether in the case of historic preservation it's even uh, something that we really do want to spend this much money on. It just seems to me to be an appropriate question for us to ask when we start uh, bringing together all of the knowledge that we've gathered in these hearings. Thank you. Chairman has a bill up on the floor. Congressman Martinez will chair the rest of the session.
Uh, Mr. Kyle, are you finished? Uh, yes, I'm finished. Oh, Mr. Shea? Thank you. I, I really had very little to add, but I do want to say it, it strikes me that this is a, a project that had a thousand deaths and that you basically said never say die and, and found a way to keep it on the on the table. I'm struck by the fact that probably some of the motivation was you had a heck of a lot of money invested of your own money. Um, what's significant about this project as well is that it, you have the historic tax credits, you have the MADRI, you have the UDAG, the uh, mortgage insurance. The, um, it, it had a number of elements to it plus uh, the, the private equity, which really was, I think, uh, hard to justify. Um, you also had uh, a, a high-powered consultant who really made things move, and I, I just have to tell you that um, uh, if you said that your consultant was technical in the sense that he helped you put together the grants uh, in, in the technical sense, uh, but basically, I'm struck by the fact that you really needed someone to move it, and, and it happened. And really what is ultimately significant about this is whether it was an incredible lapse of memory on the part of the secretary. He basically wanted this project funded, and he told two people to fund it. And one person uh, said, no way, and it still got funded. So my only observation is that it, this would probably be a good study in, in how uh, persistence wins out. And, and in some ways, um, you did uh, what you needed to do involving uh, the local officials and all that. Uh, it's probably a, a nice project. Uh, but ultimately, we have people who I've come to really respect a lot say it just shouldn't have been funded. And I, uh, I marvel at your, um, your tenacity. And I'm not going to ask you any questions. Well, it's not uh, it's, uh, stupidity and some other things. Uh, you, know, you just keep plunging after these things. Well, and, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't your stupidity, but it may have been ours, and that's what makes me angry about it. Uh, I, I can, I am, I understand the cost argument, um, and I hope you understand my perspective in that that there are really benefits that we have yet to see from this project, and, and the, ultimately the cost may be still too high, yeah, but, uh, see, for, but the benefits are. Are, are great. The, the benefits are, are great because uh, th their housing is needed everywhere and we can always justify that it's just that there wasn't the competition. And if there was the competition, a lot of these programs that did provide benefit would never have gotten right. the first I mean, We base. originally entered the competition on this project and I would concur that, frankly, if this project were to be competitive, there ought to be a second uh, way to uh, deal with the, the historic component so that the housing component of it doesn't bear the burden of the uh, other issues that had to be addressed to save this building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Nice Shea. Yeah. Uh, you know, I uh, missed most of your, well, I missed all of your testimony. I was watching a part of the hearing on the TV until they, something came, else came up. But, uh, you know, from the beginning, and let me tell you why I'm, I'm going to take the time right now, and the chair, as the chairman, take a chairman's prerogative to ask you to get into maybe not ask you, but a little dialogue with you on it, because um, one of the things that I did uh, back in my own community was start to develop properties uh, on the basis that um, there was a kind of of um, home needed that wasn't being provided for. I built the first condominiums in uh, my community of Monterey Park. Uh, they had never been done before that. It, uh, one of the reasons was is because housing stock was dwindling and there was uh, no building going on. And one of the reasons no building was going on was because of strict uh, requirements of the zoning code and the building code and the side lot requirements and all the other requirements that are necessary to put a project together. But we found a way to do it with condominiums. Condominiums because of the increase in the uh, uh, the, what you could sell um, condominium for rather than just build an apartment and then defray the cost over a five-year period and then trade it up and, and out and the various things that developers and, and speculators do. But one of the things that we always did it with our own private money, not with government money, but I think we would have taken a lot of chances had we known that the government was going to back it or guarantee it or the money was going to come from Ginny May certificates or whatever. What the question I'm going to ask, or the dialogue I want to get into, you, would uh, speculators and developers take the risk if they had to put up all the own, take a risk on that property as it was if they had to put up all their own money? 
You mean no bank loans or no other kinds of loans? That's right. No. Absolutely not. So anytime nobody would invest their own private dollar, it's a bad risk. But our government doesn't look at things like that. You know, you say, well, there's long-range benefit that hasn't been realized yet from this kind of a project. Uh, you know, I'm not too sure in the long run if you really look at uh, uh, the kind of money that was invested here and the whole pattern of the way of doing things that was established during that period of time and that there were a lot of other smaller projects that went begging because they didn't have the influence that this project had uh, that probably would have realized a better return on the dollar invested by the government. You know, all the time I hear uh, uh, my colleagues on one side of the aisle referring to cost-effective programs and to uh, running government like business. And in the uh, seven years that I've been here, I haven't seen it run like business, uh, really. And I think that a lot of it is because the bureaucrats, after we've passed the programs into law, are uh, develop the rules and regulations to administer, and they don't always have the same emphasis as the Congress did in passing it. And then, too, the other uh, things get into it, such as the influence in particular situations like this. And so that the program is uh, so diluted by the people that are running it that then it becomes a question of, and justifiably so, do we get rid of this program and do away with all these kinds of programs? Because the people that they were intended to help, they're not helping. And that it's costing the government so much. And the co government, and, and remember, the government is the people, and they're the taxpayers' dollars. And it ends up uh, being ripped off, if you would. And I'm wondering why, and because I've done it, I've uh, built units, I've uh, relocated units, I've uh, uh, refurbished units, I've done it all, maybe not on the grand scale of uh, this particular project, but I know one thing always that I had in mind, that I was sticking my own money in there, and that if it was too great a risk, I wasn't going to do it. And I'm wondering if maybe somehow it, you don't feel, on, in retrospect, that this project wouldn't have been necessarily uh, the most cost effective, and I don't know if that's the proper terminology to use, but that for the dollar return, and even though there might be long uh, range benefits, uh, you know, if, if it takes too long to recapture the money invested, you really have wasted that money because you could have invested in something that would have returned the dollar to you quicker in a, in, in a better return. And so I'm not sure that who it's going to be a better uh, project for, except that it's going to provide housing for some people that wouldn't otherwise have the housing over the long haul, and that those people might be in a little better situation than that general neighborhood, as I understand it, around there. But then there always becomes that other factor, the deterioration of a project. I remember when, in my area, the Maravilla projects, as they called them, were built. They were brand new and sparkling. And it wasn't too long because of the surrounding neighborhood that they were down the tubes with the rest of it. So you can argue those pro and con uh, till uh, uh, you're blue in the face. But that's not really the point. The point is. Would would you, if you were sitting in the government's position, have approved that project? I think um, the, and I, I hope it's clear, and I, I think this is today, I'm told this is the attitude in the Greensboro area office, that the one uh, lingering argument is the cost, that, um, that uh, you know, we were able to do what we thought we could do way back when, and they didn't believe we could, but We've done that, but the, the one thing that still remains is the cost of the project. Um, I have not tried to defend it, although I have, I've said perhaps there are different ways to look at the cost. Uh, for instance, the mod rehab is over 15 year period, so therefore you want to, dis, you want to do some present value on that. Um, you know, it's a policy matter, I think, for the government. Uh, does the government uh, only deal with housing and therefore deal with housing in the most uh, efficient economic way it can? Does it deal with, in, in today's, uh, with today's techniques, what used to be called urban renewal, and that's it's paying attention to the fabric of a whole neighborhood, not just a site? Um, I told you, the, or before you came in, sir, the, there's $6 million worth of private investment right across the street under construction right now. Um, I hope that this, that this thing doesn't deteriorate. We did the mill because we thought we could bootstrap a neighborhood. So far, it's working. The state's putting a new road in. and. Um, you know, we, I, I think where we get back is, is the cost issue, and then what's, how much should the government pay for what's been achieved? 
I think you're right, Mr. Allen. Uh, we thank you very much for appearing before us today. Uh, uh, there's no other questions, and so we are adjourned. Thank you, sir. Join us Tuesday morning here on C-SPAN, beginning at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific time, for a live coverage of a hearing conducted by the House Budget Committee. Members will preview the economic forecast for fiscal year 1990 with Richard Darman, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Coming up next, an address by Don Atwood, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Good morning from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN.